Democrats and Republicans, people with differences on how we fix the system to come together and flush out the things we agree on. And I think when we look at all of these issues, whether it's criminal justice, health care, education, they should not lean with a partisan lens because they impact Democrats the same way they impact Republicans. So let me ask this you know, this question um, now that you, well, you brought that up. But is, certainly, um, Democrats have been criticized. Um, uh, I think uh, Mitt Romney called this Justice and Policing Act um, messaging. But even others, people who are reliably vote Democrat, have wondered what has the party done for African Americans? It looks good, like the kneeling, like the kinte cloth, but. Are we going to see any real concrete change? I want you to respond, uh, Antoine, to the people who say, oh, the Democrats are taking, um, you know, the black vote for granted, and there's a lot of talk, but not enough action. I know you speak to these lawmakers. You know where their heart is. You advise them. What do people need to know? Well, I think people need to understand that losers do not legislate. And, or say it a different way, you cannot govern if you do not win. We have the majority in the U.S. House of Representatives, so we can pass legislation all day, every day. We know the so 400 and some uh, bills that sit uh, on Mitch McConnell's desk that came from the House. If we do not win elections in the Senate, if we do not win races down the ballot, some of the implement some of the things we want to implement, and some of the things we want to fix that have been broken for a very long time in the system will never be fixed unless we win. So I think that's so important. To say that Democrats take any constituency for granted, I think is the biggest bunch of Bojangle I've heard in a very long time, particularly the most loyal constituency in a, ge in a generation, black voters. African-American voters have been loyal to the Democratic Party because I believe when we are able to govern, the policy prescription we put forth and we advocate for is very reflective of what the African-American community needs are. And I would say that's why every election is so important. And that's why we have to participate at certain levels to send the message that we care about governing just as much as we care about the idea of governing. Uh, Antoine, um, the, one of the questions that I have is, uh, if you watch a little bit of that interview uh, with Nora O'Donnell, the anchor mm -hmm. of the CBS Evening News, and former Vice President Joe Biden, she asked him if what we've seen happening over the last couple of weeks has changed his mind about who he might be looking at as a potential running mate, as a potential vice presidential uh, running mate. Um, he said no, because uh, that would indicate that this was the first time he was aware of some of the things that people are angry about in the streets. But do you think that there are some calculations that are happening behind the scenes? As I look at a live picture here of Jerry Nadler uh, getting ready to call this committee hearing into session, um, Antoine, so we may end up cutting you off if it starts, uh, although there's a lot of preamble before these things get rolling. What are you hearing about that, vice presidential nominee, given that you just said how reliable um, Democrats, in particular African Americans, and in particular African American women, are to uh, the Democratic Party? I think Joe Biden, more so than any other person who ran for this party's nomination, understands how his bread was buttered. Uh, he would not be the nominee without African American voters. He also knows the importance of not just <laughs> tapping into a woman on the ticket, but tapping into a woman that's very reflective of the heart and soul of this Democratic Party, African American voters. So in that regard, I don't think his move or his conscience has changed. What I do think uh, has happened as a result of all the things going on around us is the need for a person on the ticket to be able to speak to the experiences of people who are going through some of the pain that we've seen people around this country go through. And I think there's a heightened sense of urgency around picking someone who would walk in the shoes of those certain type of experiences and will be able to articulate those on not just on the campaign trail, but also when Joe Biden wins the White House from a governing standpoint. Antoine, I want to get you to answer this question because I'm really curious about you. So your take on this whole this whole conversation about defunding the police. Um, yeah. The phrasing, I think, at times uh, is almost a gift to uh, this law and order president, as he puts himself, because I think there's a lot of confusion about what it is that yeah. is being called for. Can you explain when people say defund the police, what are they saying? Well, first and foremost, when Republicans want to defund government, they call it tax cuts or trimming down the fat in government. So we've been we've seen them do it 
uh, in other ways when it comes to cutting necessary and critical funding to agencies that really, really matter. But I think when people use the word defund the police, it gives political ammunition, I think, to Republicans to use it against us in the court of public opinion. Uh, I would probably say it a different way. What I would say is let's demilitarize the police. Let's make structural changes to the system. Let's invest in more community policing, uh, not necessarily cutting law enforcement, because all of us agree uh, that we need law enforcement to keep us safe. I do think that we cannot get into this argument and start framing things to give Republicans ammunition to use against us in, in, in the fall elections. Uh, but I don't think when you hear the term defund the police, it does not fundamentally mean let's take money away from law enforcement. I think it means let's redirect funds that could be used for other things within law enforcement in order to help make the idea of law enforcement work in this country. All right, Antoine Seawright, my friend, always good to talk to you. Brother, looking good with the hair, too, that uh, Rona hair. I really Very, like very it. good. I actually, yeah, I'm, I think, it, I think I'm saving some money. it's working for you. I'm saving some money. <laughs> <laughs> good on you. Good on you, brother. <laughs> Uh, all right. Thank you, Antoine. We appreciate it. Uh, we're looking at a live picture there of Jerry Nadler. He just gaveled in this hearing on police brutality where we expect to hear from George Floyd's brother. Let's listen. And we will circulate the materials to members and staff as quickly as we can. In light of what's going on in the world today, I ask that everyone in the room wear a mask at all times, except if you wish when you're speaking. But other, other than if you're a speaker, when you're speaking, uh, a witness when you're speaking, a member when he or she is speaking, please wear a mask at all times. This is for public health. I will now recognize myself for an opening statement. We are all familiar with the terrifying words, I can't breathe. They were uttered in Minneapolis by George Floyd while a police officer pinned a knee to his neck for a chilling eight minutes and 46 seconds taking from him the final breath of life. Six years ago, Eric Garner uttered those exact same fateful words while locked in a chokehold in New York City. He too died at the hands of law enforcement. Millions of Americans now call out, I can't breathe, as a rallying cry in streets all across our country, demanding a fundamental change in the culture of law enforcement and meaningful accountability for officers who commit misconduct. Today, we answer their call. Our hearts ache for the loss of George Floyd and Eric Garner. They ache for Breonna Taylor, for Amadou Diallo, for Tamir Rice, for Laquan McDonald, for Freddie Gray, for Walter Scott, and for so many other victims of police violence in all parts of America. Their shocking deaths sparked momentary outrage, but no fundamental change. And for every incident of excessive force that makes headlines, the ugly truth is that there are countless others that we never hear about. Every day, African Americans and other people of color live in fear of harassment and violence at the hands of some law enforcement officers. This is their reality. Our country's history of racism and racially motivated violence, rooted in the original sin of slavery, continues to haunt our nation. And to those who do not believe it, please look at the tragic statistics. African Americans are more than twice as likely to be shot and killed by police each year. And black men between the ages of 15 and 34 are approximately 10 times more likely to be killed by police than other Americans. This outrage is a reality we must change. Today, we examine the state of policing in America, and we look for ways to prevent racist acts of violence by police officers, to hold accountable those who commit such acts, and to strengthen the trust between law enforcement and the communities they serve. On Monday, I joined Karen Bass, the chair of the Crime Subcommittee, as well as the Congressional Black Caucus, in introducing the Justice and Policing Act, which would further that cause. The bill now has over 200 co-sponsors in the House and 36 co-sponsors in the Senate. I want to make clear at the outset that the bill is not an indictment of all police officers. 
We must always remember that most law enforcement officers do their jobs with dignity, selfless, and honor. And they are deserving of our respect and gratitude for all they do to keep us safe. We owe a debt that can never be paid to the too many officers killed in the line of duty every year. And it is clear that there are many officers, including some local police chiefs who marched arm in arm with their communities, who want to separate themselves from the dangerous behavior of others in the profession. But there are many too many officers who abuse their authority. And we cannot be blind to the racism and injustice that pervades far too many of our law enforcement agencies. And injustice that the nation is demanding that we enact meaningful change. This is a systemic problem that requires a comprehensive solution. That is why the Justice and Policing Act takes a holistic approach that includes a variety of front-end reforms to change the culture of law enforcement while also holding bad police officers accountable to separate them from those with a true ethic to protect and serve. Among other things, the bill would make it easier for the federal government to successfully prosecute police misconduct cases. It would ban chokeholds. It would end racial and religious profiling. It would encourage prosecutions independent from local police, and it would eliminate the dubious court-made doctrine of qualified immunity for law enforcement. At the same time, the bill encourages departments to meet a gold standard in training, hiring, de-escalation strategies, bystander duty, and use of body cameras and other best practices. It also creates a new grant program for community-based organizations to create local task forces on policing innovation that would reimagine public safety so that it is just and equitable for all Americans. The goal of this legislation is to achieve a guardian, not warrior, model of policing. The Justice and Policing Act is at once bold and transformative to meet the moment that calls out for sweeping reform, while also taking a responsible and balanced approach <coughs> to the many complicated issues associated with policing. I look forward to bringing it before our committee in short order. To the activists who have been sounding the alarm for years only to be ignored or greeted with half measures, it is because of your persistence and your determination that we are here today. If there is one thing I have taken away from the tragic events of the last month, it is that the nation demands and deserves meaningful change. We can and should debate the specifics, but at the end of the day, it is the responsibility and the obligation of the House Judiciary Committee to do everything in our power to help deliver that change for the American people. I look forward to hearing from our witnesses who bring a wealth of knowledge and experience on the many issues we are examining today and who will help guide us in that process. But first, I want to address just one witness, Philonise Floyd, the brother of George Floyd. We are all very sorry for your loss and we appreciate your being here today to discuss your brother's life. We must remember that he is not just a cause, a name to be chanted in the streets. He was a man. He had a family. He was known as a gentle giant. He had a rich life that was taken away from him far too early, and we mourn his loss. This is a very difficult time for our nation. We have lost more than 110,000 people to COVID-19, a toll that has fallen disproportionately on people of color. We have lost brave police officers and other frontline workers who risk their lives to serve their communities. And we have lost George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and the many, many other victims of excessive force by law enforcement. We must act today to honor their memory. I now, ranking, I now recognize the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, the gentleman from Ohio, Mr. Jordan, for his opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to uh, thank all our witnesses for being here today and extend our sympathy to Mr. Floyd and Ms. Underwood Jacobs. We are, as the chairman said, all so sorry for your loss and, and for what your families have had to, uh, had to live through and had to endure. Mr. Floyd, the murder of your brother in the custody of the Minneapolis police is a tragedy, never should have happened. It's as wrong as wrong can be and your brother's killers will face justice. Ms. Underwood Jacobs, the murder of your brother 
by the rioters in Oakland is a tragedy. It never should have happened. It's as wrong as wrong can be, and your brother's killers will face justice. There are 330 million people in this great country, the greatest nation ever, not perfect, but the best nation ever. And they understand, they understand, the American people understand it's time for a real discussion, real debate, real solutions about police treatment of African Americans. Americans also understand that peaceful protest, exercising their First Amendment liberties, honors George Floyd's memory, and it helps that discussion, that debate, and those solutions actually happen. The people of this great country, you know what else they understand? You know what else they get? They understand that there is a big difference, a big difference between peaceful protest and rioting. There is a big difference between peaceful protest and looting. There is a big difference between peaceful protest and violence and attacking innocent people. And there is certainly a big difference between peaceful protest and killing police officers. You know what else they get? You know what else the American people fully understand? They know, as the chairman said, the vast, vast majority of law enforcement officers are responsible, hardworking, heroic first responders. They're the officers who protect the Capitol, who protect us every single day. They're the officers who rushed into the Twin Towers on 9-11. They're the officers in every one of our neighborhoods, in every one of our communities, every day, every night, every shift they work, who put their lives on the line to keep our communities safe. And guess what Americans also get? Guess what else they understand? They know it is pure insanity to defund the police. And the fact that my Democrat colleagues won't speak out against this crazy policy is just that frightening. Think about what we've heard in the last few weeks. We've heard the mayor of our two, the mayors of our two largest city, Mayor Garcetti, said he wants to defund the police. The mayor of New York says he wants to defund the police. The city council in Minneapolis, a veto-proof majority, says they want to defund the police and abolish the department. This Congress started off with the Democrats, folks on the left saying we should abolish ICE, then moved to we should abolish the entire Department of Homeland Security, and now they're talking about abolishing the police. This is wrong, and the American people know it's wrong. We should honor the memory of George Floyd and work hard so that nothing like it ever happens again. And we should honor the memory of Dave Patrick Under Underwood and work hard so that nothing like that ever happens again. A week and a half ago, our mission was clearly stated. 11 days ago in Florida, the President of the United States clearly stated what our mission should be. President Trump said this, I stand before you as a friend and ally to every American seeking justice and peace and I stand before you in firm opposition to anyone exploiting tragedy to loot, rob, attack, and menace. Healing, not hatred, justice, not chaos, are the mission at hand. Well said, Mr. President. Healing, not hatred, justice, not chaos. That is our mission. The president is right, and I appreciate his leadership. This is the House Judiciary Committee with its storied history of defending the Constitution and the rule of law. Let's adopt that mission, healing not hatred, justice not chaos. Let's work together to make America the great place to continue to make America the greatest nation ever. That I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Jordan. I now recognize the chair of the Subcommittee on Crime, Terrorism, and Homeland Security, the gentlelady from California, Ms. Bass, for her opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, I want to thank you for your years of leadership on this issue. I know you've been involved for many years supporting police reform, and I want to thank you for convening this hearing today. What we saw in Minnesota, the slow, torturous murder of George Floyd by a uniform officer, was an outrage and a tragedy. What we have seen since then, millions of Americans marching in the street to demand justice and call for reforms, it has been an inspiration. And minus a few days of violence, it has been peaceful, and it has been in the American tradition. And what we have here today is a hearing in the U.S. Congress to examine policing practices in America and paths to reform. And so we have an opportunity. 
What we have seen since then is an opportunity to rethink the nature of policing, an opportunity for meaningful accountability in policing, and it is an opportunity to show the nation and the world that we are listening and that we will act. Too often this debate is framed in terms of citizens versus the police, us versus them, but this is really about the kind of America we all want to see. We all want to be safe in our communities. We all want the police to come to our rescue when we're in trouble. We all want to support the brave men and women who put their lives on the line for us every day. And when we interact with police, we all want to be treated with respect, not suspicion. Nobody should be subjected to harassment or excessive force just because of the color of their skin, and no one should suffer the indignities of racial profiling or be on the end of a deadly chokehold. We should all want for ourselves and for our children and for our neighbors the same. On Monday, I introduced, along with Chairman Nadler and more than 200 members of Congress, H.R. 7120, the Justice and Policing Act. This bold, transformative legislation would help reimagine the culture of policing while holding accountable those officers who fail to uphold the ethic of serving and protecting their communities. I know later, when we do a markup, there'll be an inter we will entertain an amendment to change the name of the legislation in honor of George Floyd. If this, if this had been a law last year, George Floyd would be alive because chokeholds would be banned. Breonna Taylor would be alive because no knock warrants for drugs would be banned. Tamir Rice would have graduated high school this May because he, the officer that killed him, had been fired from a nearby department and he lied on his application. But this legislation calls for a national registry so that would not have happened and Tamir Rice would have graduated high school. I understand that change is difficult, but I am certain that police officers are professionals who risk their lives every day and they're just as interested in building a strong relationship with the communities that they serve based on mutual trust and respect as those who rely on their protection are. They want to increase and, and uh, upgrade the profession, and so having national standards, it should never be that you can do a chokehold in one city and not in another. There should be basic standards, there should be basic accreditation, there should be continuing education, just as there are in so many other professions. When I was at the service yesterday, and when I was there, I looked up at the picture of George Floyd, and I, I saw the year that he was born. He was born in 1973. And that was an important year in my life because that was the year in Los Angeles that I joined an organization called the Coalition Against Police Abuse. That was 47 years ago. Our police chief at the time, we were suffering from a number of victims who had died because of chokeholds. Our police chief held a press conference where he told Los Angeles that the reason why black people died of chokeholds was because our neck veins were different. They didn't open up as rapidly as normal people. That's where we were 47 years ago. The question remains for us though, it was 29 years ago that we saw the Rodney King beating. And as an activist at the time, I was sad at the tragedy. It was horrific to see him beat like that. But most of the activists said, finally, finally, we know we'll have justice. There's no way these police officers are gonna get off because the whole world saw what happened. In the civil rights movement, what led to the great change in the end of legal segregation, aside from the tens of thousands of people that protested, it was the fact that there were cameras there. The, the beatings, the treatment of black people in the South had gone on for, frankly, hundreds of years, but it wasn't until those cameras exposed that that then things began to change. And so what has happened in the 29 years since Rodney King with the advent of cell phone cameras? We have seen example after example after example. 29 years since Rodney King, 20 years since Amadou Diallo, six years since Eric Gardner, just weeks since the death of George Floyd. His death cannot be in vain. I told his brother that his name will live on in history because the tragedy that he suffered has been the catalyst for what I believe will be profound change. And not just change that helps to professionalize police departments, not just change that prevents further abuse and deaths, but an opportunity for communities through receiving grants 
to take a look at their community and say, well, there's all of these issues that we face. Why should police officers have to address homelessness and mental illness? Police officers complain all the time. They're not social workers. That's right. So with these grants, maybe communities can take an opportunity to re-envision what public safety is and come up with models, better models to work with police, better models to reduce the problems that wind up needing a police officer. So that's what we have an opportunity to do in this Congress with this piece of legislation. And I hope that we work for passage of this legislation in the House, it gets through the Senate, the President signs it, and in the year 2020, we never, ever, ever see again what we saw a few weeks ago. It wasn't just a tragedy for our country and our nation, but it really was an embarrassment of our nation in front of the entire world. While we hold up human rights in the world, we obviously have to hold them up in our country. And with that, I yield. Thank you. Since Mr. Radcliffe, the former ranking member of the Crime Subcommittee, has left the committee to serve as Director of National Intelligence, I now recognize the ranking member of the Subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties, the gentleman from Louisiana, Mr. Johnson, for an opening statement. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I want to join all my colleagues today in thanking all of our witnesses sincerely for being here, and, and especially uh, Mr. Floyd and Ms. Underwood uh, Jacobs for making the trip in the midst of such tragedy and difficult circumstances to share your experiences with us. It's very valuable to us, and we're grateful. Uh, of course, you have our condolences and our profound um, uh, sadness for your losses. And, and I and my family and the, the community of faith that I represent have been praying for you and will continue to do that. Uh, we're gonna talk about policing practices and reforms today, and, and that's a really important topic. But since this is the first full committee hearing that we've had in judiciary since the tragic death of, of Mr. Floyd, I think it's also important for us to acknowledge here in the beginning what's believed by so many to be a root cause of the persistent challenges we face together as a country, and that is the need for authentic reconciliation in our communities. Everyone here understands the plain and simple truth that racism in any form violates the most fundamental principles of our great nation and the rules of our creator. The central idea of America, let's not forget, is the, the idea that we boldly declare the self-evident truth that all men are created equal and that they're thus endowed by God with the same inalienable rights. Because each of us is made in the image of God, there are very serious implications that come from that. Among them is the idea that every single person has an estimable dignity and value. And our value is not related in any way to the color of our skin or what zip code we live in or what we can contribute to society or anything else. Our value is inherent because it comes to us by our creator. Any fool who contends he has some sort of natural right of supremacy over his neighbor violates not only the foundational creed of America, but the greatest commandments of the God who made him. And if we can ever learn to see one another as God does, I think it'll solve a lot of our problems. This unspeakable act of cruelty that America witnessed in Minneapolis has opened an important new dialogue on reform. And while policing has always been regarded as an inherently local function, we do agree that Congress has a key role to play in ensuring that abuses are not tolerated and can never happen again. Justice has to be swift, and bad police officers have to be held accountable for their actions. But at the same time, we want to be careful to recognize, as all my colleagues have this morning, that, that officers like the ones involved in the death of George Floyd are not representative of the vast majority of America's law enforcement officers. Most are faithful, self-sacrificing public servants who put their lives on the line every single day to protect and serve our communities. We need to honor that, and we need to recognize and empower those law enforcement officers, which is precisely the opposite of the radical, dangerous proposals we're seeing right now to defund them. A government of by and for the people must be a nation of law and order, and public safety, of course, is the key to maintaining our republic. Without that, things like the rioting, looting, and violence that has led to the destruction of cities and minority-owned businesses, ironically, would, would prevail over the valuable, peaceful protests that are intended to bring about meaningful change. There's a consensus among every member of this committee, Democrat and Republican, that there are solutions we can work towards that will restore faith in our institutions and build trust in our communities. From where we sit right now, we believe the most actionable reforms must focus around three core concepts to simplify it. Transparency, training, and termination of those rare bad apples in law enforcement who violate the law and the legitimacy that upholds the character of our legal system. 
This common ground is key if we're going to, to accomplish the goal of keeping our communities safe, upholding the civil liberties of individuals, and protecting the legitimacy of law enforcement. None of these goals that I've outlined today are mutually exclusive, of course. We, we can and should clearly condemn the senseless violence we've seen and all causes of it, from a few bad apples wearing a badge to the bad actors and anarchists sparking riots and destruction in our streets. At the same time, we can work together on meaningful reforms and real results while upholding the respect and appreciation that is due to every American patriot who faithfully serves us on the thin blue line. I have faith that we can work together as a committee. This is a bipartisan concern and we'll have bipartisan solutions, I hope. For the future of our country and for generations of Americans to come, we have to do that. I urge my colleagues in this moment, all of us, to, to, to hear and, and to listen to our witnesses and work with each other as friends and fellow Americans to understand the need in our communities and foster our discussions on a foundation of civility and mutual respect. We started that, and I hope we can continue it. With that, I yield back. Thank you. Without objection, all other opening statements will be included in the record. We have an unusually large panel today. But given the broad range of issues that we will be discussing, we have, we have invited a broad range of witnesses. As is customary, the minority was given the opportunity to invite witnesses as well, and they have selected Mr. Bongino, Pastor Scott, and Ms. Underwood Jacobs. We welcome everyone and thank them for, for their participation. Now, if the witnesses would please rise, I will begin by swearing you in. Do you swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to give is true and correct to the best of your knowledge, information, and belief, so help you God? Let the record show that the witnesses answered in the affirmative. Thank you, and please be seated. Please note that each of your written statements will be entered into the record in its entirety. Accordingly, I ask that you summarize your testimony in five minutes. To help you stay within that time, for those witnesses testifying in person, there is a timing light on your table. When the light switches from green to yellow, you have one minute to conclude your testimony. When the light turns red, it signals your five minutes have expired. For our remote participants, there is a timer on your screen to help you keep track of time. Given the large number of witnesses, I will introduce each witness and then invite him or her to give his or her testimony before introducing the next witness. We will begin with Mr. Floyd. Philonese Floyd is the brother of George Floyd, who was killed by Minneapolis police officers on May 25th. Mr. Floyd has spoken eloquently about his brother's life, and we appreciate his being with us today, having flown to Washington to testify before us today directly from his brother's funeral in Houston yesterday. We are all so sorry for your loss. Mr. Floyd, you may begin. Chairman Gerald Nadler and members of the committee, thank you for the invitation here today to talk about my big brother, George. The world knows him as George, but I called him Perry. Yesterday, we laid him to rest. It was the hardest thing I ever had to do. I'm the big brother now, so it's my job to comfort my brothers and my sisters Perry's kids, and everyone who loved him. And that's a lot of people. I have to be the strong one now because George is gone. And me being the big brother now is why I'm here today. To do what Perry always would have done, done. To take care of the family and others. I couldn't take care of George that day he was killed, but... Maybe by speaking with you today, I can make sure that his death would not be in vain. To make sure that he is more than another face on a t-shirt, more than another name on a list that won't stop growing. George always made sacrifices for our family and he made sacrifices for complete strangers. He gave the little that he had to help others he was our gentle giant. I was reminded of that when I watched the video of his murder. He called all the officers, sir. He was mild-mannered. He didn't fight back. 
he listened to all the officers. The man who took his life, who suffocated him for eight minutes and 46 seconds, he still called them sir as he begged for his life. I can't tell you the kind of pain you feel when you watch something like that. When you watch your big brother, who you looked up to your whole entire life, die, die begging for his mom, I'm tired. I'm tired of pain. Pain you feel when you watch something like that. When you watch your big brother, who you looked up to for your whole life, die, die begging for his mom, I'm here to ask you to make it stop. Stop the pain. Stop us from being tired. George called for help, and he was ignored. Please listen to the call I'm making to you now, to the calls of our family and the calls ringing out the streets across the world. People of all backgrounds, genders, and races have come together to demand change. Honor them. Honor George and make the necessary changes that make law enforcement the solution and not the problem. Hold them accountable when they do something wrong. Teach them what it means to treat people with empathy and respect. Teach them what necessary force is. Teach them that deadly force should be used rarely and only when life is at risk. George wasn't hurting anyone that day. He didn't deserve to die over $20. I'm asking you, is that what a, is that what a black man is worth? $20? This is 2020. Enough is enough. The people marching in the streets are telling you enough is enough. By the leaders that is our country, the world needs the right thing. The people elected you to speak for them, to make positive change. George's name means something. You have the opportunity here today to make your names mean something too. If his death end up changing the world for the better, and I think it will, then he died as he lived. It is on you to make sure his death is not in vain. I didn't get the chance to say goodbye to Perry while he was here. I was robbed of that. But I, but I know he's looking down at us now. Perry, look up at what you did, big brother. You changed the world. Thank you for everything, for taking care of us on earth, for taking care of us now. I hope you found mama and you can rest in peace with power. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Floyd. Vanita Gupta is the president and CEO of the Leadership Conference on Civil and Human Rights. Ms. Gupta previously served as an acting assistant attorney general at the Department of Justice and led the department's civil rights division. She received her JD from New York University School of Law and her BA from Yale University. Ms. Gupta, you may begin. Thank you, Chairman Nadler, Mr. Floyd. Thank you for being here today and for those incredibly powerful words, and we are so sorry. Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Collins, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. And thank you, Chairman Nadler, for calling this hearing on policing practices and the need for transformative policies that promote accountability, begin to reimagine public safety, and respect the dignity of all people. While the recent murder of George Floyd at the hands of four Minneapolis police officers put the issue of police brutality in the national spotlight, the outpouring of pain and anger is anything but a reaction to one isolated incident or the misconduct of a few bad apples. Instead, the outcry is a response to the long cycle of stolen lives and violence with impunity toward black people in our nation. We are now at a turning point. There is no returning to normal. We have to create a new way forward, one that does more than tinker at the edges that promotes data and training. We need something that truly transforms policing and leads to more accountability for communities. 
It is imperative that we get this right and that Congress's response in this moment appropriately reflects and acknowledges the important work of Black Lives Matter, the movement for black lives, and so many people that are bringing us to this tipping point. My tenure as head of the Justice Department Civil Rights Division began two months after 18-year-old Michael Brown was killed by a police officer in Ferguson. The Justice Department was hardly perfect, but we understood our mandate to promote accountability and constitutional policing in order to build community trust. During the Obama administration, we opened 25 pattern or practice investigations to help realize greater structural and community-centered change, often at the request of police chiefs and mayors who needed federal leadership. After making findings, we negotiated consent decrees with extensive engagement and input from community advocates who not only identified unjust and unlawful policing practices, but also helped develop sustainable mechanisms for accountability and systemic change. That is not the Justice Department that we have today. Under both Attorneys General Jeff Sessions and Bill Barr, the department has abdicated its responsibility and abandoned the use of tools like pattern and practice investigations and consent decrees. Instead, it is focused on dismantling police accountability efforts and halting any new investigations. The disruption of crucial work in the Civil Rights Division and throughout the Department of Justice to bring forth accountability and transparency in policing is deeply concerning. In the absence of federal leadership, the Leadership Conference Education Fund launched the New Era of Public Safety Initiative, a comprehensive guide and toolkit outlining proposals to build trust between communities and police departments, restore confidence, and imagine a new paradigm of public safety. While much of these changes must happen at the state and local level, success is going to require the leadership support and commitment of the federal government, including Congress. Last week, the Leadership Conference and more than 400 civil rights organizations sent a letter to Congress to move us forward on a path of true accountability. The re recommendations included the following. One, create a national necessary standard on the use of force. Two, prohibit racial profiling, including robust data collection. Three, ban the use of chokeholds and other restraint maneuvers. Four, end the militarization of policing. Five, prohibit the use of no-knock warrants, especially in drug cases. Six, strengthen federal accountability systems and increase the Justice Department's authority to prosecute officers that engage in misconduct. Seven, create a national police misconduct registry. And eight, unqualified immunity. The Leadership Conference was pleased to learn that the Justice and Policing Act introduced Monday by both members of the House of Representatives and the Senate reflects much of this accountability framework. This is Congress's most comprehensive effort in decades to substantially address police misconduct by taking on issues, critical issues, affecting black and brown communities. And as the bill advances toward passage, we will continue to work on it and to ensure that real change is, is achieved. But let me just say in closing that policing reform alone is not gonna solve the crisis that we're in today. This moment of reckoning requires leaders, together with communities, to envision a new paradigm of public safety that respects the human rights of all people. That means not just changing policing practices and culture, but ultimately shrinking the footprint of the criminal legal system in black and brown people's lives. And it means shifting our approach to public safety from exclusively focusing on criminalization and policing towards investments in economic opportunity, education, healthcare, and other public benefits. Police chiefs and officers talk about the same thing. This approach will only, not only further equity, but also constitute effective policy. When we stop using criminal justice policy as social policy, we will make communities safer and more prosperous. Now is the time for Congress to pass lasting accountability measures, and we look forward to working with you until the day that these reforms are signed into law. George Floyd's death, has impacted the world, and now it is on us to change it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Without, a, without objection, at the request of the ranking member, I will now recognize the distinguished minority leader of the House for a brief introduction of his constituent, our next witness, Angela Underwood Jacobs. Thank you, Chairman Nadler and ranking member Jordan for convening this very important hearing. Mr. Floyd, thank you for your powerful words. I'll, thank make, you. I'll make one promise to you, your brother will not have died in vain. I'm here to introduce Angela Underwood Jacobs, her husband Michael and her daughter Trinity. More importantly, 
I'm here to listen to them and all of you. Now, I know Angela, and I'm proud to call her a friend. She is a mother, a businesswoman, and the first black woman to become a city council member in Lancaster, California. Angela is here to testify because her brother, Dave Patrick Underwood, he was tragically and senselessly murdered in the line of duty two weeks ago in Oakland. We mourn and pray for Angela and the entire Underwood and Floyd family. As a member of the Federal Protective Service, Pat was guarding a federal courthouse, a symbol of equal justice and the rule of law, during the riots in Oakland on the night of his death. It appears his death was part of a targeted attack on federal law enforcement. We pray that justice comes swiftly and completely for Pat, for George Floyd, and all victims of violence. Pat Underwood should be alive today. George Floyd should be alive today. David Dern should be alive today. And so should countless others. And though we cannot bring them back, we can learn from their lives and deliver the justice and change they deserve. I hope that every member of this committee will listen closely and carefully to what Angela has to say. Our nation must listen, and it must heal. Like Dr. King, we must reconcile our differences with a renewed sense of love and compassion. Like President Lincoln, we must remember that we are not enemies, but we are friends. Friends that have a responsibility to rise above. To make sure we all become the more perfect union we strive to be. And I hope at this moment in time, we rise to the occasion. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. McCarthy. Ms. Underwood-Jacobs, you may begin. Thank you very much, and I, I truly appreciate the opportunity to be here today. As a nation... As a people, we must come together to defeat fear, hate, prejudice, and violence. I want to ensure the memory of my brother, Patrick, is as a catalyst against injustice, intolerance, and violence of any kind. I want to honor my brother, Dave Patrick Underwood, and our family, and help our nation think about how to navigate the righteous path to equality, freedom, and nonviolent systemic change. I want to extend my sympathies and condolences to George Floyd's family. Mr. Floyd's murder was just not cruel and reprehensible, but criminal. The officers involved should be brought to justice and held accountable for their actions or as well as their inaction. I wish that same justice for my brother Patrick who served with distinction and honor as a federal officer for the Department of Homeland Security until he was murdered anonymously by blind violence on the steps of the federal courthouse in Oakland, California. As he took his last breath on the cold, hard cement after being shot multiple times, he died. Fear Hatred, ignorance, and blind violence snatched the life of my brother Patrick from all of us. Dr. Le Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. preached, always avoid violence. If you succumb to the temptation of using violence in your struggle, unborn generations will be recipients of a long and desolate night of bitterness. And your chief legacy to the future will it be an endless reign of meaningless chaos. I have spoken to many people across this country, in fact, across the world, regarding what is going on in America. America is in pain and she is crying. Can you hear her? I am here to seek justice through the chaos for my brother Patrick, for George Floyd, for citizens of all colors, for communities across America, and for the police officers that protect those communities and their citizens every day. The actions of a few are dividing us as a nation. 
at a time when we should be coming together and uniting for the well-being of all people. We will never solve generational systemic injustice with looting, burning, destruction of property, and killing in the name of justice. We must find lawful, peaceful solutions that uplift and benefit everyone. And this, this is greater than a black, white, or blue issue. It is a humanity issue. When those in a position of authority choose to abuse their power, that is the very definition of oppression. And when innocent people are harmed in the name of justice, no one prevails, we all lose. Everyone deserves the opportunity to feel heard, be seen, and feel safe. Police brutality of any kind must not be condoned. However, it is blatantly wrong to create an excuse of dis out of discrimination and disparity to loot and burn our communities, to kill our officers of the law. It is a ridiculous solution to proclaim that defunding police departments is a solution to pr police brutality and discrimination because it's not a solution. It gets us nowhere as a nation and removes the safety net of protection that every citizen deserves from their community's elected officials. There is a path to achieving what we desire and deserve as a nation and as a people. Equality, fairness, justice, peace, and freedom from oppression. It is the same path we started on during the civil rights movement. The, the solution to our nation's ills are straightforward. Education. We need to actually invest in education again and make it our nation's top priority. Through education comes knowledge, through knowledge comes understanding, and through understanding comes opportunity and freedom. Jobs. If there isn't any chance of making a decent living, there isn't any chance of having a decent, just society. We need to create more jobs that in turn will create more economic justice for all Americans. Housing. There is no way to live a decent life if you can't find, or in America's case, afford shelter. We need to listen and learn from each other. It's time for everyone to open their ears and listen to what each other has to say. America is the world's melting pot because we have so many people, cultures, beliefs, and points of view. And somehow we become siloed. As a single voice in this chambers, attempting to honor my brother and family, I hope I can make a difference today. I want to make America, I want America to make a change. I want you as our representatives in Congress to make a change so that no one ever has to wake up to the phone call that I received telling me that my brother was shot dead and murdered. How my brother died was wrong, and I'm praying that we learn something about how he lived. Patrick was the type of man that when our mother fell to the ground as she was dying, he picked her lifeless body up as her spirit was leaving to place her upon her bed because that's where she wanted to die. My question is, who will pick up Patrick and carry his legacy? I believe this is a responsibility for all of us. Please do not let my brother Patrick's name go in vain. Patrick was a good man who only wanted to help others and keep his community safe. He had an infectious laugh and a corny sense of humor. He would go out of his way to help family, friends, and strangers. He did not deserve to die in such a horrendously inhumane way. No one does. Now, my family is in a state of hollow disarray. We all feel the anxiety of wondering what tomorrow may bring or may not bring, which was, has struck fear in our hearts. Nevertheless, I wholeheartedly urge us all all Americans, not to give in to hate and anger, but to resolve conflict with kindness and love, to lead with a sense of purpose and renewed energy 
to create positive change as I have outlined here through education, jobs, housing, and listening. Pat didn't tell anyone how to live, but he lived. And what an amazing life it was. I will never forget the way my brother smiled and the way that he loved his family with every piece of his heart. My wish is for us to live and live without fear and discrimination. Do not simply tolerate your neighbor, but strive to understand one another. And we will be a better, more just society for all. Thank you. Thank you. Our next witness is Art Acevedo, who serves as the chief of the Houston Police Department and also serves as president of the major cities Chiefs Association. Chief Acevedo received his BS in public administration from the University of Laverne. Chief Acevedo, you may begin. Thank you, Chairman. Ms. Underwood, Mr. Floyd, follow us. Condolences. Know that we're lifting you in our prayers. Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Jordan, and members of the committee, thank you for the opportunity to participate virtually in today's hearing. It's good, it's good to be with all of you, and especially my Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee and Congresswoman Garcia. I want to thank Congresswoman Sheila Jackson Lee and Congresswoman Bass for their leadership. As the Major State Chiefs Association reviews the Justice and Policing Act, please know that we support the intent and look forward to working with the committee. I appear before you today as the Chief of Police in Houston, Texas, and it is also my privilege to testify on behalf of the Major City Chiefs Association as their president. No matter the circumstance, every time a life is taken, a loved one is taken. George Floyd was a child of God and raised in Houston. His death was deeply disturbing and a shock to the conscience. Over the past few days, I've had the opportunity to meet with the Floyd family and I will continue to lift them in prayer. Mr. Floyd, thank you to you and your family for allowing us to join you on your brother's journey home. There is no denying that changes in policing must be made. Out of crisis comes opportunity, and this is an opportunity for all of us to have some tough conversations, to listen, to learn, to an, and to enact meaningful reform that is long overdue. As a profession, we must learn what is being shared with us. That includes being honest about our history. We must acknowledge that law enforcement's past contains institutional racism, injustices, and brutality. We must acknowledge that policing has had a disparate treatment and impact on disenfranchised communities, especially communities of color and poor communities. Several topics have risen to the forefront and all reforms must be vetted and ensure to ensure that they are sustainable, effective, and have no unintended consequences. Several topics have, law enforcement plays an important role. No two calls for service are the same. And in Houston, we respond to an average of 1.2 million calls for service annually. Those calls disproportionately originate from communities of color. If we are going to talk about better policing, we also need to talk about the root causes behind the need for those calls for service. Some think defunding the police is the answer. I'm here to tell you on behalf of our mayor and other mayors across the country and police chiefs across this country and the diverse communities that we serve, this is simply not the answer. Defunding the police without addressing the social economic reality faced by poor communities and the disenfranchised and how they are riddled with missteps which would increase the need for police services. History has shown that underfunding the police can have disastrous consequences and hurt those most in need of our services. Appropriate police funding is critical to ensure agencies have resources to invest in technology like body-worn cameras, recruit qualified police officers who are service-minded, and train in implicit bias, train in cultural competency, train in de-escalation and other critical training. The overwhelming majority of cops are good people. This cannot be lost. They are faithful public servants who put their uniform on every day, willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. 
we can't let, again, the actions of bad cops let us lose sight of the fact that most cops are good. We must all judge each other through the prism and content of our individual hearts and actions, and not through the prism of color and the uniform that we wear. While there is no national use of force standard and previous efforts at establishing one were met with this agreement, several components are ubiquitous throughout the U.S. Prioritization of the sanctity of life, duty to intervene, and the use of de-escalation tactics and techniques is a must. Let me be clear. The actions of the four officers involved in the death of Mr. Floyd are inconsistent, unjustified, and repulsive. They are contrary to the protocols of the policing profession, and they sabotage the law enforcement community's tireless efforts to build trust. Moving our profession forward begins with a sustained commitment to accountability. From the start of academy training, recruits must understand that they have an absolutely an absolute duty to put public safety, service, and security first. In the Houston Police Department, we instill in our men and women the certainty that policy violations regarding truthfulness will lead to termination, or as we put it, if you lie, you die. It is important to note that every chief's administrative authorities are different across the nation, and that not everyone has the legal authority to take immediate action like Chief Arredondo did. I am encouraged what there have been eras in America's history when police have found it difficult to speak up. We are speaking up today. But let it be clear, for many years, officers have consistently been holding one another accountable, and complaints about police misconduct overwhelmingly originate from within agencies, not from members of the community. Communities have an absolute responsibility as well. We ask citizens to report police misconduct without fail. This will afford us the opportunity to investigate, track, and report those complaints. We must also address the issue of officers who have been terminated with cause only to get rehired by another department. Many of us refer to these individuals as gypsy cops. Many gypsy cops have exhibited troubling behavior, and that in turn undermines efforts to build trust with the public and efforts to, in terms of internal department accountability. Transparency breeds trust, and trust breeds respect. Mutual trust and respect between law enforcement and the public is crucial to good policing. The civil unrest occurring throughout our nation and throughout this entire country is a sobering reminder of how quickly we will lose uh, public trust and the, the consequences of that fact. Ensuring the department looks more like the communities we serve helps build trust and confidence. Unique perspectives and insights help a department and several, uh, help a department lead and serve the communities of color. I'm happy to report that the Major City Chiefs Association has several departments now that are minority majority, like the city of Houston and the Houston Police Department, and are reflective of the communities that we serve. On behalf of the Major City Chiefs, I want America to know that we hear you. We will continue to do everything in our power to facilitate your right to peacefully protest. The MCCA will not shy away from this challenge and will continue to be a leader and voice in the national discourse and race relations, policing, and reform. To the Floyd family and to the activists across the nation, our commitment is to be your voice, to join you, and to make sure that Mr. Floyd's death was not in vain. I yield the remainder of my time and look forward to any questions the committee may have. Thank, Thank you. you, Chief. Our next witness is Ms. Sherilyn Eiffel. Uh, Ms. Sherilyn Eiffel is the President and Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund. She received her JD from New York University School of Law and her BA from Vassar College. Ms. Eiffel, you may begin. Good morning, my name is Sherilyn Eiffel. I'm the President and Director Counsel of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund the nation's oldest civil rights legal organization formed in 1940 by Thurgood Marshall. I want to thank Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Jordan. I want to salute the leadership of Representative Bass and the Congressional Black Caucus on this issue. And I want to extend, on behalf of the Legal Defense Fund, my deepest condolences to the Floyd family and thank them for their courage and their voice at this important moment. 
We welcome the Justice in Policing Act as a first step in addressing the decades-long call and demand for policing reform. The legislation includes reforms that LDF's policing reform campaign has advocated for years to ensure greater accountability for police officers who engaged in, engage in misconduct and brutality. Members of Congress incorporated a number of our proposals in the act, which is a step in the right direction toward ensuring police accountability nationwide. I want to first focus this committee's attention on the significance of this moment and the importance of the federal government's role in addressing this crisis. You are in a civil rights moment. In 1964, 1965, 66, and 67, cities all over the North in this country were gripped by urban unrest. In Watts and Detroit, Harlem, Minneapolis, and scores of other cities, Black people took to the streets to protest police brutality. It was during that period of unrest that Dr. Martin Luther King said, riots are the language of the unheard. The 1968 Kerner Commission was created to study the source of that unrest. And much of the report's findings and recommendations focused on law enforcement presence and conduct in Black communities. This period overlapped with the years that most people think of as the core civil rights movement when Black people in the South petitioned, protested, marched, and demanded federal legislation to address segregation, voter suppression, and economic injustice. The result were core civil rights statutes, the Civil Rights Act of 1964, the Voting Rights Act of 1965, and the Fair Housing Act of 1968. But despite the unrest in northern cities, in over 100 cities during that decade, there was no legislation to address the issue of police brutality in African-American communities. And as a result, very little has changed since that period as it relates to this issue. Therefore, too many officers know that they can commit the most heinous acts against African-Americans without fear of accountability. Ranking member Jordan said that the killers of George Floyd will face justice. But we also know that those who killed Philando Castile, Eric Garner, Terrence Crutcher, Eleanor Bumpers, Michael Stewart, Clifford Glover, Sean Bell, Amadou Diallo, and countless others never were held accountable for the crimes they committed. That snapshot of former officer Derek Chauvin kneeling on the neck of George Floyd with his hands in his pockets, looking out with no fear of being vide videotaped, should shame every member of this body, every judge, every lawyer, everyone who has participated in the perpetuation of a system that calls itself a justice system but routinely allows officers of the state to take innocent life with impunity. You have the chance now to change that. One of the key parts of the system of impunity has been qualified immunity, a defense that shields officials from the unforeseeable consequences of their act, but has been interpreted by courts so expansively that it now provides near immunity for police officers who engage in unconstitutional acts of violence. LDF has litigated a number of these cases. For example, in 2018, we filed a petition in the United States Supreme Court appealing a decision of the uh, United States Court of Appeals for the 11th Circuit that affirmed summary judgment in favor of a law enforcement officer who tased our client, Carrie Illage, 19 times to death. The U.S. Supreme Court denied the petition, and this case was not a one-off. Every year, cert petitions are filed in the court seeking review of cases in which law enforcement officers have successfully eluded accountability for the most violent forms of brutality by raising the qualified immunity defense. The Justice in Policing Act seeks to address qualified immunity by amending the civil rights statute used most in police excessive use of force cases, 42 U.S.C. Section 1983. And we welcome this amendment. We want it to apply to all civil suits that are pending or filed after enactment of the act. And we'll continue to work towards the elimination of qualified immunity. There's bipartisan support for ending qualified immunity. And so I'll close my remarks by quoting from a federal circuit court judge in a decision issued just this week in the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals. It was written by a judge appointed first to the bench by George W. Bush. And he said in Jones versus City of Martins, Martinburg, Martinsburg, Judge Henry Floyd said, Wayne Jones was killed just one year before the Ferguson, Missouri shooting of Michael Brown would once again draw national scrutiny to police shootings of black people in the United States. Seven years later, we're asked to decide whether it was clearly established that five officers could not shoot a man 22 times as he lay motionless on the ground. Before the ink dried on this opinion, the FBI opened an investigation into the death of yet another black man at the hands of police 
this time George Floyd in Minneapolis. This has to stop. To award qualified immunity at the summary judgment stage in this case would signal absolute immunity for fear-based use of force, which we cannot accept. This decision represents a minority of cases, and so we need Congress to act. You are required by history to meet this civil rights moment. It is a moment in which we have a chance to transform our approach to public safety, to recognize that most community conflicts do not require the intervention of an armed officer, and to speak our values through federal and state budgets that prioritize our commitment to anti-discrimination, to public health, and to true public safety for all. Thank you. Thank you. Our next witness is Daryl Scott, who is the founder and senior pastor of the New Spirit Revival Center, a non-denominational church in Cleveland Heights, Ohio. Pastor Scott is also the author of the book, Nothing to Lose, Unlikely Allies in the Struggle for a Better Police, for a Better Black America. Pastor Scott, you may begin. Chairman Nadler, members of committee, Ranking Member Jordan, thank you for inviting me to participate in these very serious hearings today. I want to begin by stating that the prospect of defunding and or dismantling police forces across the country is one of the most unwise, irresponsible proposals by American politicians in our nation's history and makes absolutely no sense at all, at least to me. I believe it is nothing short of the politicizing of current social events in an effort to garner votes during this election season. I also believe that it's a reactionary measure that can and will result in short and long-term damage to American society, particularly in our inner city and urban communities. Now, I recognize the fact that the elimination of excessive force and physical retaliation by officers of the law against American citizens is paramount today. I recognize the fact that racial profiling and the harsh treatment of minorities is a very real reality that must be eliminated immediately. I myself can testify of times in my life when I felt racially profiled by police. I can testify of times in my life when I was pulled over for driving while black. I can testify of giving my grandson, who is now of driving age, the talk of how to properly behave if pulled over by police because, because he had the question of a very real fear of the possibility of death at the hands of police. In fact, my very first interaction with police when I was 13 years old resulted in me being roughed up. I could very easily have been George Floyd. George Floyd could have very easily been me, my brothers, my friends, or any number of any other black men in America. However, I do not recommend throwing the baby out with the bathwater by labeling all police officers as bad cops simply because of the bad actions of a rogue segment of those whose job is supposed to be to protect and to serve American citizens. In fact, in certain inner city communities across America, increased funding for police and increased police presence is actually necessary in order to enforce the law and to guarantee the safety and the security of law-abiding members of those communities. As one who was formerly in that street life years ago, I might be a pastor, but I didn't come down from heaven. I came up out of hell with the rest of everybody else. I was formerly in that street life. I know very much about the criminal element, and I can state definitively that the criminal element in and of society would enjoy nothing better than a reduction in police presence and police power. It would allow those with criminal intentions and criminal actions to flourish virtually unchallenged in the communities of America. The law-abiding members of society would be directly threatened by the absence of police or the inability of police to respond to criminal activities and in many cases would endeavor to take the law into their own hands to ensure the, their safety and well-being as evidenced by the response of some who decided to defend themselves and their property from vandalism. An absence of police presence could potentially give rise to acts of domestic terrorism, mob rule, gang rule, neighborhood intimidation, oppression, and vigilanteism. 
Defunding of police departments has already happened in a number of American cities, and rather than remedying problems, has actually made conditions much worse. The city of Cleveland, my hometown, is a prime example of the results of police defunding. In 2004, the city of Cleveland laid off 285 officers. The entire police budget was slashed by 31% to cover basic services. The following units were either disbanded or cut forever. The district strike force units, the narcotics unit was completely cut. SWAT was downsized. The fugitive unit was disbanded. The auto theft unit was disbanded. The intelligent unit was cut to bare bones. The mounted unit was cut 85%. The aviation unit was down completely for three years and is now only utilized during special events. The harbor unit was disabled. The boat sits rotting in a dry dock. The scientific investigation unit was cut 80%. All the lab techs were let go. All the evidence collection is now done by priority. The D.A.R.E. Uh, problem, the Drug Abuse Resistance Education Program was cut. Community policing was cut 45%. Cleveland went through a decade-long downsizing, which saw department, the department reduce from 1,900 officers to 1,500 officers on average. Zone car coverage, which directly affects citizens, has been cut. Police presence in any given district or in any given shift has been cut in half. One- and two-man units have been cut in half. Response time is dramatically longer if the police show up at all. The murder rates have climbed. The property crime is at record levels. Aggravated robbery statistics are higher. Drug sales, drug use, drug abuse is higher. Drug and alcohol related motor vehicle accidents are the highest they've ever been. Cleveland has went from a relatively safe city per capita to an unbelievably unsafe city. Calls for service have increased even though the, uh, the, the, the population has dropped significantly over the last 20 years. Once safe areas of the city are now unsafe. One, once nice neighborhoods neighborhoods in the city are now not nice. Homicides are up 55% in Cleveland from this time last year, and Cleveland now has a higher murder rate per 100,000 residents than Chicago does. I believe that police departments are only as effective as politicians and their appointees allow them to be. Consequently, politicians and appointees are directly responsible for the state of their police departments. Law-abiding citizens, and I've spoken to a great deal of them, overwhelmingly think that defunding or disbanding police departments is a horrible idea. Community policing is a very viable option to address the needs of inner city communities. Having police in the communities to actually get to know the residents is the best way to obtain the results that we all want. When I was growing up, the residents and the business owners knew the police officers that were assigned to our neighborhoods and their presence was a deterrent to criminal activity. So in short, defunding of police departments in America has already happened and it has proven to be an epic fail. We cannot allow that paradigm to continue if we want the neighborhoods of America to be safe to live in, the streets of America to be safe for residents to walk on, and the communities of America conducive for businesses to thrive in. So I recommend and I agree with the fact that police reform, or better yet, police revision, revision should be enacted. But it has to be one that is sensitive to the stress, tension, pressure and paranoia that policing produces. The fact that on any given day, any given call, any given stop can result in an officer's death can be very challenging mentally while also being sensitive to the citizens of America who are supposed to be protected by the police and not be enemies of the police, whether in the suburbs or in the inner cities, whether we're black, white, red, yellow, or brown. I really believe that most police officers, most cops began their careers, most bad cops began their careers as good cops, but they allowed the rigors of their job to affect their perspectives and their social interaction with those they are supposed to protect, and they began perceiving those that they are supposed to protect as those they themselves need to be protected from. I'm in agreement, I endorse police reform but it has to be sensitive to both sides of that issue. Thank you for allowing me. God bless you. Thank you. Um, 
Before I call the next witness, I just remind witnesses to turn off their mics when you're not speaking. Turn them on when you're speaking. Turn them off when you're not speaking, please. Our next witness is Mr. Paul Butler. He's the Albert Brick Professor at Georgetown University Law Center, where he specializes in criminal law and race relations. Professor Butler is also the author of the book, Let's Get Free, A Hip-Hop Theory of Justice and Chokehold, Policing of Black Men. Mr. Butler received his JD from Harvard Law School and his BA from Yale University. Mr. Butler, you may begin. Chairman Nattler, Ranking Member Jordan, honorable members of the committee, thank you for this opportunity to testify. Mr. Floyd and Ms. Underwood Jacobs, I'm so sorry for your loss. May the memory of your brothers, the memory of the other martyrs be a blessing to the people all over the country, all over the world who are rising up in what Martin Luther King called the beautiful struggle for equal justice. There has never, not for one minute in American history, been peace between black people and the police. And nothing since slavery has sparked the level of outrage among African Americans as when they feel under violent attack by the police. Black people have endured Jim Crow segregation, being shut out of Social Security and the GI Bill, massive resistance to school desegregation, nonstop efforts to prevent us from voting, and poison water. But the rare times black people have set aside traditional civil rights strategies and instead have risen in the streets, destroyed property, and resisted symbols of the state has been because of something that the police have done. Watts in 65, Newark in 67, Miami 1980, LA 1992, Ferguson 2015, Baltimore 2016, Minneapolis in 2020. All of those cities went up in flames because the police killed another black man. Unlawful violence is never acceptable, either as a misguided approach of a few or as an abuse of the power and trust we place in law enforcement officers. The main problem is not bad apple cops. Officers have difficult jobs and many serve with honor and valor. Still, almost every objective investigation of a police department finds that police as policy treat African Americans with contempt. The police kill, wound, pepper spray, beat up, detain, frisk, handcuffs, and use dogs against black people in circumstances in which they do not do the same to white people. When armed agents of the state are harming American citizens in our name, we the people must ask why. In the past two weeks, we've seen acts of grace and bravery by police officers. Cops in New York took a knee. In Houston, Chief Acevedo arranged for an honor guard to accompany Mr. Floyd's body when he came home. Unfortunately, we have also witnessed these past two weeks police officers commit deplorable acts of violence against the citizens they've sworn to serve and protect. In New York, officers drove two large police vehicles into a crowd of protesters. In Atlanta, officers broke the window of a car, dragged out two college students, and shot them with a stun gun in Buffalo. A police officer knocked a 75-year-old man to the ground, but what happened next was just as bad. When two officers were disciplined for that criminal conduct, 57 other officers quit the sky in protest. President Obama's task force on policing decried the warrior mentality present among too many law enforcement officers. In Buffalo, the nation saw warriors on steroids. African American and Hispanic people disproportionately bear the cost. Blacks are about 20% of the population of Minneapolis, but 60% of the people who cops use violence against. The result is that there are more black people in the criminal legal system today than there were slaves in 1850. When I mentioned to a young man I mentor that if he attended protests, he should wear a mask, he said he certainly would try. But he wanted me to know that as a young black man, he has a greater risk of dying from police violence than from the coronavirus. According to the National Academy of Science, one in 1,000 African American men and boys will be killed by the police. What African Americans need to realize equal justice under the law 
is for selective enforcement and police brutality to end. We need the police to stop killing us, to stop beating us up, to stop arresting us in situations in which they would not do those things to white people. The Justice and Policing Act is a common sense reform. Among other things, it requires cops to be trained on understanding racial bias. In Minneapolis, as three officers crushed the life out of Mr. Floyd, and another served as a lookout, somebody in the crowd said to the cops, he's human, bro. But these four officers did not treat Mr. Floyd like a human being. Too often, police work seems to enforce the dehumanization of people of color. Understanding the history and reality of racism in the United States will make our men and women in blue more effective officers. In the end, this hearing is about the legitimacy and sustainability of our democracy. No justice, no peace is not a threat. It is simply a description of how the world works. The multiracial, multigenerational demonstrations that have risen up all over the United States reflect the wonderful diversity of our great nation and the potential of ordinary citizens to make our country live up to its highest ideals. The Justice and Policing Act of 2020 heralds the urgency of transformation and the promise for all Americans of equal justice under the law. Thank you, Mr. Butler. Our next witness is Benjamin Crump. Benjamin Crump is the founder and principal owner of Ben Crump Law. He is also currently representing George Floyd's family. Mr. Crump received his JD and BA from Florida State University. Mr. Crump, you may begin. Thank you, Chairman Nadler and distinguished members of the committee. I know all the speakers have five minutes to speak, but I wish it was eight minutes and 46 seconds, not as a symbolic gesture, but as an actual exact time reference of how long George Floyd literally begged. He literally narrated a documentary of his death, begging for his life, saying, I can't breathe, and calling for his mama. The death of George Floyd has galvanized the world and mobilized Americans to demand a more just system of policing because it's become painfully obvious that what we have right now are two systems of justice, one for white Americans and another for black Americans. George is one in a long line of black Americans who unjustly are killed at the hands of police or, in George's case, at the knee of the police, including Breonna Taylor, Pamela Turner, Botham John, Michael Brown, Stephon Clark, Eric Gardner, Tamir Rice, Philando Castile, Terrence Crutcher, Laquan McDonald, just to name a few. And the list goes on and on. But it is important, Mr. Chairman, that we remember their names. It's way past time that we revise the role of police to become peacekeepers and community partners. Of course, they must be prepared to protect themselves and the public in direct life-threatening situations. But these should be the exception and not the rule. What we are witnessing throughout our country is not that. Americans are being tear gassed in the streets, hit with rubber bullets, shoved violently to the ground, cracking their skulls against the pavement, beaten bloody with batons, and for what? For demanding justice for black Americans. Our constitutional rights are under attack and not in the shadows, but in the broad daylight. Ch 
changing the behavior of police and their relationships with people of color starts at the top. We need a national standard for policing behavior built on transparency and accountability. The only reason we know what happened to George Floyd is because it was captured on video. The advent of video evidence is bringing into the light what long was hidden. It's revealing what black Americans have known for a long, long time, that it is dangerous for a black person to have an encounter with a police officer. Given the incidents that have led to this moment in time, it should be mandatory for police officers to wear body cams and should be considered obstruction of justice to turn them off. Like a black box data recorder in an airplane, body cams rep replace competing narratives with a single narrative, the truth with what we see with our own eyes. Second, insist that police officers only use the level of force needed based on the level of threat actually posed by the circumstances. We've seen way too many black people shot in the back or unarmed black people shot and killed or a handcuffed black man face down on the pavement asphyxiated by a knee on his neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds though he posed no threat at all. Neck restraints were used by Minnesota police more than 200 times, resulting in suspects losing consciousness at least 44 times. Lethal restraints like choke holes and stringer holes should be outlawed. Finally, reform how qualified immunity applies to police officers. If officers know they have immunity, they act with impunity. If officers know they can unjustly take the life of a black person with no accountability, they will continue to do so. That's what you saw in the eyes of Derek Chauvin when, with his hand casually tucked in his pocket as he extinguished the life of George Floyd. Accountability requires that officers face public consequences for unjustly taking a life or brutalizing a fellow American that are sworn, they, they are sworn to protect and serve. Too often, many officers are silent in the face of evil because of the blue shield. The Brotherhood of Police Officers, which fosters systematic racism and abuse. But there's a higher brotherhood that God calls us to honor, the brotherhood of mankind, black and white. That's what we're witnessing in the diversity of the protesters filling our streets even today. And that's the brotherhood our police officers must honor above all. The founding fathers knew they had not built an infallib infallible system a faultless union, but they did task us with the perpetual duty to aim for it, a more perfect union of justice, liberty, resilience, hope, and compassion. We have to do better, and we must strive to live up to those American ideals. We are better than this. Chairman, members of the committee, you have the power to make this moment in history the tipping point so many of us have been waiting for, fighting for, and praying for that Americans are marching for. You have the power to make sure that George Floyd's death is not in vain. 
I've been asking for us to take a breath. Number one, the breath that George Floyd was denied. Secondly, take a breath to consider how we use police in our society and how we hold them accountable for the tremendous power we place in their hands. Thirdly, to take a breath to consider how we create a more perfect union that extends equal protection and equal justice to people of color. And finally, to take a breath for George Floyd because his life mattered and black lives matter. I thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Crump. Uh, Ron Davis is the Legislative Affairs Chair of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives, or NOBLE. From 2013 to 2017, Mr. Davis directed the Office of Community-Oriented Policing Services at the U.S. Department of Justice. In 2014, he was appointed Executive Director of the President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. Mr. Davis received his B.A. from Southern Illinois University and completed the senior executives in state and local government program at Harvard University Kennedy School of Government. Mr. Davis, you may begin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good morning, Mr. Chairman and Ranking Member Collins. I uh, want to thank you for hosting this hearing, and I come to you today on behalf of Noble, and on behalf of our president, uh, Police Chief C.J. Davis, the executive board, we want to, again, thank you for allowing us to testify today. Uh, as you mentioned, before serving as a director of the cop folks, we also served close to 30 years as a police officer, 20 years in Oakland, and about nine years as the police chief in the city of East Palo Alto. I do want to say Noble joins the nation in condemning the heinous killing of Mr. Floyd, and we offer our heartfelt condolences and prayers to the Floyd family, and I want to thank Mr. Floyd this morning for his powerful testimony and strong recommendations. Yet, Mr. Chairman, we know that the date of George Floyd is just one in a long list of tragedies. We also know that the vast majority, as the, as the uh, Reverend had mentioned, of, of police officers in this country are decent, honorable, committed men and women to service. But we know that the core problem of policing are not just about a few bad apples. I think too often we talk, focus on the bad apples, and we need to acknowledge, Mr. Chairman, that the problem policing today continued use of draconian policing systems that still suffer from structural racism and severe institutional deficiencies. Under these systems, even cops have bad outcomes, and bad cops and racist cops can operate with impunity. Most of the systems that we are talking about were determined that determined why we police, how we police, where we police, were constructed in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, and they were actually constructed to enforce Jim Crow and other discriminatory practices. In other words, this committee should acknowledge, the nation needs to acknowledge that our policing systems are in fact not broken. They are doing what they were actually designed to do. To understand this hard truth is to recognize that this system cannot be reformed, it must be reconstructed. It also means that the demand for policing reform should not require an indictment against all police. In fact, it is our hope that our brothers and sisters who wear the badge will not only embrace this moment, but will join this movement and become a part of the change that is needed. We've seen police chiefs and officers walk with crowds and take a knee, and that is great. We now need them to take a stance and stand with the community as we reconstruct this unjust system. The first step in reconstructing a new system is to strengthen police accountability and trust with our communities. This, in fact, was the core charge that President Obama gave the task force on 21st century policing. And in 2015, the task force provided recommendations for police agencies and their communities to advance this. Unfortunately, the Trump administration not only tossed this report away, it has actually retreated backwards to the so-called law and order days, days in which the mass arrest of men of color was this nation's crime strategy. We need to abandon that dangerous rhetoric. We need to abandon the idea of law and order. and We need to embrace a peace and justice mantra that enhances public safety and ensures justice for all. 
Mr. Chairman, we need the support of the federal government to further advance the recommendations from President Obama's task force. We also need to make some immediate actions. In the interest of time, I will say that we support the eight bullets that Benita Gupta outlined with the Leadership Conference of Civil Rights. And I won't go over those eight bullets since it's already in the testimony. Uh, we also believe that we need to immediately resend the session memo so that the Department's uh, Civil Rights Division, Department of Justice Civil Rights Division can immediately restore the use of consent decrees where appropriate. We believe that we should store, restore programs within a cop's office that allows police departments to do volunteer reviews so that they can identify deficiencies in their operating systems and structural uh, programs. And we believe that all police agencies should obtain some type of accreditation before receiving federal funds. We also need the federal government's help in supporting local and state efforts. In the absence of this DOJ, it's been the states that have been stepping up. So for example, the state of California and Governor Gavin Newsom passed Assembly Bill 392, the most comprehensive use of force reform bill in the nation. Last week, Governor Newsom also ordered the state to stop teaching the carotid hold or carotid restraints or chokehold and made clear that he would support any legislation that prohibit those techniques. In Illinois, former Attorney General Lisa Madigan and current Attorney General Kwame Raoul used their office to negotiate with the city of Chicago to adopt the most comprehensive consent decree in the nation's history. And in California, Attorney General Becerra used his office to conduct pattern and practice investigations, provide organizational assessments, and use of force reviews. And most recently in Minnesota, Attorney General Keith Ellison worked with Department of Safety Commissioner John Harrington and used their office to convene a task force, a working group of diverse people to address the issue of bit, uh, police deadly encounters. Now, unfortunately, the group released their report just weeks after Mr. Floyd was killed, so it was too late to impact that tragedy, but it does provide a roadmap for Minnesota as it moves forward. These are all activities that the Th Trump thank administration you. has Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, and these are all activities that are sorely needed if we're going to address police reform. In some, the recommendations that have been outlined, the ones I just mentioned, the ones that Ms. Gupta outlined, the ones that you've heard today are all contained in the Justice and Policing Act. And we appreciate Congresswoman Bass, yourself, Mr. Nadler, and all the co-sponsors for introducing this comprehensive bill. And Noble looks forward to working with this body as you move the bill forward. Thank as you. we proceed, there thank are you, immediate steps you, that I believe police leaders and departments can take. Thank and I you. want to basically quickly go thank over five points that I would ask my colleagues, <laughs> police chiefs and police leaders to follow. And that we, these are the steps that we can do to start the racial reconciliation that was mentioned earlier that we have yet to done, do, and to start the re reimagining policing process. The first step is to publicly acknowledge the historical and current, too often we just say historical, but the historical and current police abuses that occur and its impacts on communities of color. The more police chiefs acknowledge this, do so publicly, the more we can start our reconciliation. Second, the acceptance of responsibility to change our policing system and its culture. Three, I think it is time for all police officers to reaffirm their oath of office to the Constitution and to the core principles of our democracy. And I say that because we need to be reminded that the oath is to the Constitution, not to each other, not to the police department, not to the police union, but to the Constitution and our democracy. Four, collaborate with community to redefine and reimagine policing including the development of reinvestment strategy that rely less on police or more community-based safety programs. As we debate funding about the departments, I think we can have some core agreements that we definitely in, we need to invest in the social programs, the community-based community -based programs that go more to the core causes of crime than just the safety. Mr. And Davis, the uh, your time has expired. Services. Mr. Davis, thank you for your testimony. Your time has expired. Our next witness is Daniel Bongino. Uh, Daniel Bongino has served with both the New York Police Department and the United States Secret Service. He's also a best-selling author and host of the Dan Bongino Show podcast. Mr. Bongino has an MBA from Penn State University and both an MA and BA from the City University of New York. Mr. Bongino, you may begin. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member Jordan, I deeply appreciate the opportunity to speak on this critical issue. Ms. Underwood Brooks, Mr. Floyd, deeply sorry for your loss. I can only hope you take some solace in the justice that we all pray is to come. I mean that. That was a tough video to watch. 
for all of us. Police officer Dan O'Sullivan, he was a friend of mine. We went through the police academy together. Sadly, we lost touch when we graduated. So we were both assigned to separate precincts, different areas of the city of New York. Dan and I were briefly reunited in 1998, but it was no joyous occasion. I was reunited with Dan in a hospital in Queens, where he was hospitalized with devastating injuries after pulling over off duty to assist a driver in a critical emergency situation. He was hurt badly. Dan was the very essence of a public servant. Dan always put himself last while putting his commitment to the safety and security of the public he pledged to serve always first. That was the Dan I knew. During my employment with both the NYPD and the United States Secret Service, I had the honor and profound privilege of working with agents and police officers who had committed themselves to a higher cause. Just like Dan, I met so many of these committed public servants that sadly, I can't even recall all their names anymore. These are good men and women. Yes, as with any profession, there are officers, no question, who aren't suited for the job. Some will cause trouble, sometimes worse. We've seen that. But in my experience, this is rare and becoming rare. The special agents I work with and remain friends with to this day in the Secret Service join members of the NYPD and New York City Fire Department on that tragic day of September 11, 2001. You know what they did? They sprinted into those burning buildings and personally escorted people out. As we all know, those buildings collapsed, taking many of those brave NYPD and FDNY souls with them. Those brave souls were running into the buildings. Everyone else was evacuating. These are the types of people I was honored and deeply privileged to work with. Public safety came first. Everything, everything else came second. Sometimes even their own families. The defund the police movement will target these heroes. They are the police, these people. It's not some amorphous mass that will be affected. It's real heroes in real time, right now. Removing these heroes from your communities and my community will do nothing but ensure chaos and destruction. Police officers are the front lines, putting themselves between the evildoers among us and the honest, hardworking Americans just yearning for some security and prosperity in a small slice of Americana. We can and should commit to police accountability. There's no question about that. But we can do it without shredding the thin wall between civilization and chaos. There are few jobs in the country as stressful as policing. I receive an email or a text a few times a year notifying me about the death or injury of a police officer I knew, worked with, or knew someone I worked with. Imagine if that was happening at your job. Think about that just for a minute. God forbid you found out a coworker of yours was killed or injured in the line of duty in the course of doing their job. You didn't just get the text. You got this text a couple times a year. That's policing. That's what they do. They risk their own lives for yours. I'll say in closing, I spoke at an event for police officers years ago, and a spouse of one of these heroes said this. She said, the most wonderful sound in the world for the spouse of a police officer is the sound of Velcro at night. Maybe saying, why Velcro? Because it's how a police officer's body armor is secured to their bodies. And when that body armor comes off and that sound echoes in their ears, the families of these heroes know that they're finally home safely. I ask you, please, with the greatest of respect and humility, Please stop this defund the police abomination before someone gets hurt. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Bongino. Our next witness is Philip Goff. Philip Goff is the co-founder and president of the Center for Policing Equity. He also serves as the inaugural Franklin A. Thomas Professor in Policing Equity at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Dr. Goff received his PhD and MA from Stanford University and the AB from Harvard University. Dr. Goff, you may begin. Thank you, Chairman Nadler, Ranking Member Jordan, members of the House Judiciary Committee. I want to say that we mourn with you. And to Mr. Floyd, I want to thank you especially for your powerful witness in front of this body and the entire country. 
I offer my deepest condolences for the circumstances that made your presence here necessary. I want to say that your words have moved a nation that was already mourning with you. Um, to everyone gathered, it is my honor to be back before the committee to provide testimony on policing practices and law enforcement accountability. My background and training are in behavioral science. I am the inaugural Franklin A. Thomas, a, prof uh, a, a professor in policing equity. Um, I was a witness um, for the President's Task Force in 21st Century Policing, a member of the National Academies of Sciences Committee that issued a consensus report on proactive policing. I was one of the three leads on the recently concluded Department of Justice funded National Initiative for Building Community Trust and Justice. But I'm likely best known for my work with the Center for Policing Equity, the leading research and action organization focused on equity and policing, and my testimony today is in that capacity. CPE maintains the National Science Foundation funded National Justice Database which we understand is the largest collection of police behavioral data in the world. Our work focuses on combining police behavioral data, psychological survey data, and data from the U.S. Census to estimate not just racial disparities in police outcomes, such as stops and use of force, but the portion of those disparities for which law enforcement are actually responsible and can do something about. I have to say that what we have seen in the streets of the United States over the past two weeks nearly defies description. Some have called it massive protest, others have called it a riot, others have called it a revolution. What I am confident is that what we have seen has been larger than the incident that sparked collective outrage and is still tearing at the fabric of our democracy. What has spilled out onto the streets of this nation is even larger than our grief at the brutal extinction of George Floyd's light and the light of the thousand citizens per year killed by police, a number that has not changed significantly since newspapers began cataloging those numbers in 2015. What we're seeing on the streets of the United States is a past due notice for the unpaid debts owed to black people for 400 plus years. If the responses to this moment are not proportional to that debt, I fear we will continue to pay it with interest again and again and again. Turning to the complex issue of police reform, I applaud the work of Chairman Nadler and Congresswoman Bass for putting forth a comprehensive proposal to rethink how we best hold law enforcement accountable to the ideal of equality. The Justice and Policing Act of 2020 contains a number of critical reforms, including banning neck restraints and creating a national registry of police misconduct. In my capacity at CPE, however, I wanna spend a moment focusing on what science says about bias in policing. I feel it's important to set a baseline, especially with all of the false information circulating in media, given the general vacuum in the ecosystem on evidence in this area. First, there is no doubt that Black, Native, and Latinx people in this country have more contact with law enforcement than do white people. There's also relative agreement that where there are fewer public services, so fewer drug treatment, mental health, job training programs, law enforcement has more contact with residents. There is evidence of racial bias in who was contacted by police and who was targeted for force. However, it is also the case that clearly not all the disparities we see are from police policy or behavior. It is some, but not all. Uh, given this understanding of bias in policing, what are we to do? As we've already heard today, the most recent debate is between institutional reform and defunding the police. While there is no quantitative research literature on abolishing policing, there are reasons to believe that many within black communities are not fully aligned with this vision. Historical and polling research reveal that black communities support less biased and less deadly law enforcement more than eliminating it. But with the mood of the nation changing so quickly, so too may these attitudes. And still, to the degree that a path forward involves using police budgets to invest in black communities, the process must be led by evidence. Evidence about what programs work, both in policing and in communities, and evidence about where cities can safely receive a higher return on their investment in community empowerment. And regardless, there is no need to wait for a decision on police budgets to invest in our most vulnerable communities. Wherever the country lands on police budgets, we can all agree the communities that have the resources to solve their own problems and do not need to call the police in the first place are safer communities that are better equipped to realize the American dream. There is no reason to avoid this obvious truth, and there is no reason not to act on it now. As I previously mentioned, the Justice and Policing Act of 2020 contains the best federal police reform package of the bills I have seen before this Congress, and CPE supports its passage. 
Many of our partners in law thank, enforcement, thank the you. chiefs, who are thank experts on public safety, support many of its provisions, especially the federal ban on neck restraints and the implementation of a national registry of police officers who have been fired for misconduct. Conduct. These reforms are long overdue, and such common sense reforms should be enacted immediately. Thank you very much. More specifically very, and briefly, I want to emphasize the need you. for a national registry of police officers thank you very who have been much. fired for misconduct is a reform that will increase transparency and the public's trust in law enforcement agencies. Doctors and lawyers, those tasked with protecting life and liberty, as officers have to do both on their jobs every day, those along with many other professions are required to be licensed and their employment data are shared across state lines by appropriate entities and in appropriate ways. Without such thank a you, Thank you, Dr. Goff. Your five minutes have expired. Uh, our, next, our next witness is Mark Morial. Mark Morial is the president and CEO of the National Urban League. Mr. Morial also served as mayor of New Orleans from 1994 to 2002. He received his JD from Georgetown Law School and his BA from the University of Pennsylvania. Mr. Morial, you may begin. Thank you very much, Chair Nadler and Ranking Member Jordan, uh, members of the committee. Uh, to Representative Bass, thank you for your incredible leadership uh, on this issue. Uh, first, we at the National Urban League strongly support the passage of the Justice in Policing Act. And to Mr. Floyd and Ms. Underwood Jacobs, I join uh, in sharing our thoughts and our prayers with you on your losses. Your courage is admirable. Thank you very much. Between 1882 and 1968, that's an 86-year period, 4,000 742 people, mostly black, were lynched in the United States. These murders were turned into public spectacles with people being tortured, mutilated, and burned in front of hundreds of spectators mocking their deaths. In 1922, the United States House of Representatives had the courage to pass a bill to make lynching a federal crime. However, white supremacists in the United States Senate filibustered that bill and blocked 200 attempts to pass that bill, a blockage which continues to this day in the United States Senate. Imagine if in 1922, the Congress of the United States had demonstrated the courage to make lynching a federal crime, how many of those 4,742 people would not have died? Today, we look at most recent history, and we see from 1954 to 1965, Dozens of civil rights activists were murdered, including the four little girls at that Birmingham church in 1963. But this Congress, in 1964 and 1965, this Congress with bipartisan majorities and the courage of a Southern president who had previously supported segregation, demonstrated the courage and the conviction to pass the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Voting Rights Act, and the 1968 Fair Housing Act. Since 2013, when Trayvon Martin was killed in Florida, 1,200 and 91 black people have been shot and killed by the police. Over 100 of them were unarmed. And now, in 2020, as we stand just six years away from the 250th anniversary of this nation, before the eyes of the world, George Floyd, was lynched on the streets of Minneapolis, Minnesota. And the world,
from Hungary to New Zealand to Australia to Paris to London to big cities, small towns, every village, every hamlet, every neighborhood in this nation have risen up in mainly peaceful protests to simply say enough is enough. Enough is enough and black lives matter. This Justice in Policing Act represents a bold and clear step forward, but an opportunity. An opportunity at a historic time in American history as to whether this nation's elected representatives will hear the pain, hear the cries, hear the suffering, hear the outrage, and realize this is not the time for a de minimis backroom Washington political compromise. That this is a moment for bold and courageous action. And the type of action where 20, 40, 60 years hence, history will ask, your children will ask, your grandchildren will ask, where did you stand? Where did you stand? This is a moment not of politics. This is not a moment of black or white. This is a moment of morality. It's a moment of human decency. This act does a number of things. It bans some practices that we all know have to be banned. Chokeholds, no-knock warrants, warrants, racial profiling. It created a multi-tiered accountability system. Some through the system of the courts in both civil and criminal proceedings and strengthens the hands of the Justice Department so that it can do its job. It also suggests Thank you, Mayor Morial, accre an accreditation pr program. So let me just say one last thing, Mr. Chairman, if you'll indulge me, and I'll go back to what I said earlier. I'm asking this Congress, this body, and the United States Senate to recognize the gravity of this moment and the importance of this time and to stand with the people of this nation to say enough is enough, Black Lives Matter. Thank you, Mayor Morial. We've now, we've now heard from all the witnesses before the committee. The committee will now stand in recess for 45 minutes for lunch. As a matter of safety, there will be no eating in this room. The committee will reconvene in 45 minutes. The committee's in recess. All right, so we've been, been listening to uh, the list of speakers uh, in front of the House Judiciary Committee. The point of this hearing right now is to get more information following uh, the House Democrats' unveiling of their Justice in Policing Act. Um, it was a vast act that they revealed just a couple of days ago, addressing many of the concerns um, that people across the country have been talking about when it comes to law enforcement, uh, the funding of uh, police training training, whether that needs to be re revised or changed, use of force um, limitations, um, also a component of a, or presenting an, a specific anti-lynching law. So it just sort of went on and on and on. Uh, we heard from all manner of experts, uh, people from uh, within the African-American community, as well as many people representing law enforcement. And you know, we heard from at least one individual who represents a group of law enforcement officers, black law enforcement officers, sort of reminding us that in Initially, a lot of local police forces were set up to uh, enforce Jim Crow laws, patently racist laws. And so, you know, he said that the system is operating in many ways the way it was meant to. So it's time to 
to break it down and, and build it back up again. We also heard about the dedication of many, 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 the vast majority of law enforcement officers um, in this country, how they put their lives on the line every day, how the, the job is stressful. It's stressful for them and for their spouses. And uh, this is a dedicated bunch of heroes, by and large, across the board, dedicated to serving and protecting. And perhaps um, most moving, we heard from uh, the Floyd, Floyd family's lawyer, and we heard from George Floyd's brother. He would have just laid his brother to rest just yesterday and was present here at the hearing um, to talk about his experience. And I want to play some of that sound. When you watch your big brother, who you looked up to your whole entire life, die, die begging for his mom, I'm tired. I'm tired of pain. Pain you feel when you watch something like that. When you watch your big brother, who you looked up to for your whole life, die, die begging for his mom, I'm here to ask you to make it stop. Stop the pain. Stop us from being tired. George called for help, and he was ignored. Please listen to the call I'm making to you now, to the calls of our family, and the calls ringing out the streets across the world. Uh, George Floyd's brother, uh, very moving. Um, another thing that sort of stood out to me was another expert that spoke about this debate about defunding uh, the police or dismantling the police. And what he said is, we don't have a lot of information, but what we do know about the African-American community is they are not in favor of less policing. They are in favor of fair policing. Um, and so now I want to play just a little bit more from George Floyd's brother about sort of what is at the crux of his pain. He was accused of either him or someone else in his group passing off a fake $20 bill, just $20. Here's what his brother had to say. George wasn't hurting anyone that day. He didn't deserve to die over $20. I'm asking you, is that what a, is that what a black man is worth? $20? This is 2020. Enough is enough. All right, so that's just a bit of what we heard from a long list um, of speakers. Each person got to speak for five minutes, though some took a little more time. Um, the hearing has now taken a break, but when they return, that's when um, uh, lawmakers, both Republican and Democrats, will be allowed to question uh, the speakers to get a little more clarity. And once again, this is in regards to the Justice and Policing Act that the uh, Democrats and the House um, put forward just a few days ago. Now, Republicans are working on their own bill in the Senate. And um, from what we've heard from uh, Nancy Cordes, in fact, there's a lot of overlap. Um, the thing about this issue is, you know, many, many, many people agree, no matter whether they're Democrat or Republican, that uh, the system needs to be fixed. What exactly is crucial, where the priority is, how to start, maybe that's up for debate. But there certainly is bipartisan support for moving forward in Congress. Um, as for the president, well, we know that the other day uh, he said that, uh, you know, defunding the police was certainly not an, not an option. And he has stuck with his um, law and order message uh, throughout this, this whole thing. Um, so my producers are telling me we have a little more sound. Is it from the hearing? OK, we want to play uh, a little sound from uh, another from Karen Bass. 
When I was at the service yesterday, and when I was there, I looked up at the picture of George Floyd, and I, I saw the year that he was born. He was born in 1973. And that was an important year in my life because that was the year in Los Angeles that I joined an organization called the Coalition Against Police Abuse. That was 47 years ago. All right, so we're sort of, as uh, bits and pieces are coming in, we're editing and we're getting you sort of a little sampling of some of what we've learned. So I wanna play, I think, one more speaker um, that we have a little bit of sound from, hopefully, is that ready to go? Justice has to be swift, and bad police officers have to be held accountable for their actions. But at the same time, we want to be careful to recognize, as all my colleagues have this morning, that, that officers like the ones involved in the death of George Floyd are not representative of the vast majority of America's law enforcement officers. Most are faithful, self-sacrificing public servants who put their lives on the line every single day to protect and serve our communities. All right, so um, in about 45 minutes, the hearing will resume, and that's when questions and that's when the Q&A portion will take place. Um, and lawmakers will be able to question um, any number of these uh, witnesses who are, some are there uh, in real life and others are uh, testifying uh, virtually. So earlier today, though, we want to tell you about something that happened in uh, Minneapolis. Um, the police chief spoke publicly for the first time since the city council decided to dismantle the police department in the wake of the nationwide protests over George, George Floyd's death. This is what the police chief had to say. I believe I speak for my chief peers here in the state of Minnesota, as well as across our, our country, that there is nothing more debilitating to a chief from an employment matter perspective than when you have grounds to terminate an officer for misconduct and you're dealing with a third party mechanism that allows for that employee to not only be back on your department, but to be patrolling in your communities. A second key measure of my plan of reform is to integrate new systems that use research on police behavior to connect officer performance data so department leaders can identify early warning signs of misconduct and provide proven strategies to intervene. Now, why hasn't reform in this area worked in the past? The academic experts who've studied this have revealed that supervisory action alone to remove problematic officers is very rare and significantly absent in larger departments. So for the first time in the history of policing, we here in Minneapolis will have an opportunity to use real-time data and automation to intervene with officers who are engaged in problematic behavior. I'm also very excited about the generous funding and research assistance by our own Minneapolis Foundation. As I close my comments uh, before your, your questions, I also want to end by saying this. Race is inextricably a part of the American policing system. We will never evolve in this profession if we do not address it head on. Communities of color have paid the heaviest of costs, and that is with their lives. And our children must be safeguarded from ever having to contribute to the horrific and shameful chapter of this country's history. My plan will focus on imperative and respected community collaboration with an emphasis on the science of justice. I was born and raised in Minneapolis. And as a child growing up in this city, I did not see many peace officers that looked like me. And for the ones that I did, they were my true sheroes and heroes. Since I joined the ranks of this department, I've dedicated my service to not only helping, but healing. And I will continue to do that. Now, I also recognize that parts of this department were broken, and I brought attention to that several years ago. But I did not abandon this department then, and I will not abandon this department now. 
History is being written now. And I'm determined to make sure that we are on the right side of history. Thank you. As far as questions go, we'll spend the first five or so minutes taking questions from our local media first, and then we'll turn it over to the rest of the rest of the group. So if you have a question, go raise your hand. We'll call on you. The shouting stuff is going to be very confusing. So questions from the local media to start. Eric. Yes, sir. Chief, you have nine city council members who are saying defund police. Do you think your response today is enough to quash those calls? What do you say about the defund police movement in the city? Um, as chief, I'm obligated to ensuring the public safety of our 400,000 plus residents. Um, I will not abandon that. Um, our elected officials certainly uh, can engage in those conversations. Uh, but until um, there is a robust plan that reassures the safety of our residents, um, I will not leave them. I will not leave them behind. I have one. Uh, Paul, uh, just a second. Paul, go ahead. Yes, sir. Chief Paul Bloom. Yes, sir. Fox 9 News. Nice to see you this morning. Good to see you. I know you spoke about withdrawing from union negotiations. Putting you on the spot here, do you think the union president, Bob Kroll, needs to step aside. Could that help you uh, reach uh, a labor deal that you'd be happy with and the city would be uh, satisfied with? I've had and continue to have uh, very intentional conversations. All right, we're going to pull away from the uh, police chief of Minneapolis' uh, press conference talking about the changes he plans on implementing because the mayor of Minneapolis, Jacob Frey, is speaking, addressing what the chief just had to say. Let's take a listen. integrity and he has my full support. Additionally, the new partnership that we have in conjunction with the Joyce Foundation and the Minneapolis Foundation around the early intervention system is very much needed. Uh, th having the willingness to both invest and use in that technology shows his willingness to challenge the status quo, to affect the culture shift, to demand greater accountability, and to use real-time data to get that early intervention to prevent the wrongful conduct from happening in the future. Chief Arredondo right now, and you saw this during the press conference, is leading our city forward in a beautiful way with clarity and purpose with respect to the Minneapolis Police Department. Now, I want to be very clear. We don't just need a new contract with the police. We need a new compact with the police, one that centers around compassion and accountability, one that recognizes that the way things have been done for decades and decades is not acceptable. We need change. We need to go farther than we ever have in the past. It can't be lip service. It can't be the status quo. And when we look back many years and decades from now, we need to understand this point in time as the moment where we made a decision, where we made a decision that the years of lack of accountability is unacceptable, that a restructure is necessary and we are committed to it. So in seeing through that dramatic and sweeping change, I want to be very clear that I have Chief Arredondo's back. I also want to be very clear that this is a person who's born and bred in Minneapolis. He came to the Minneapolis Police Department to make a change in community, to keep people safe, and to deliver service that was, at the time, a very new model. That's the model that he brought when he was a beat officer on the north side. That's the model that he now brings to the chief's office. This is someone who quite literally sued the Minneapolis Police Department for racial discrimination, and he won. Now he's our chief, and he has my support. I have the utmost confidence in our partnership as we move forward to be able to see that full revamping and structural change and to heal our city. I'll answer any questions you may have. Mayor, have you spoken with Council President Bender or any of the other <coughs> council members who are talking about defunding the Minneapolis Police Department? And what have those conversations been about? 
yes, I have had a few conversations with council members that talked about ending the police department, and there are various different words that have been used, uh, and I do not want to put words into their mouths. Uh, what I will say is that I am committed to that deep structural reform. If you're talking about having a full culture shift in the Minneapolis Police Department, I'm on board. If you're talking about making sure that we aren't criminalizing uh, poverty or addiction and making sure that we, we have a different conceptual approach to how we handle it, I am fully on board. But if you're talking about abolishing the police department, uh, no, I am not. I've made that clear. Well, from a basic procedural standpoint, uh, by withdrawing from the police contract negotiations, there won't be additions in pay. Uh, there won't be a number of other facets that we want to be negotiating on. I don't want to tell you too much about what those negotiations might be because it would ruin uh, the leverage that we presently have. And by the way, we've got a lot of leverage right now. We want to be able to channel all of this anger and sadness and frustration towards a shift in the way that we do business. And right now is the time. Mayor, uh, the chief said he's spoken to Lieutenant Bob Cole. He's made his feelings clear to him. He didn't discuss with us what those, what those conversations were. So he sort of shied away from any questions about whether he thought he should resign as part of this restructuring. What are your thoughts on the future of Lieutenant Cole and the Federation? I've had several conversations with Chief Arredondo, uh, although I have not spoken directly with Bob Kroll. And let me be clear. The rhetoric that Bob Kroll has put out is detrimental, not just to our city, but also to the police department. For someone that complains so much about a lack of support and trust of police officers, he's the primary, one of the primary reasons for that lack of trust and support. Uh, I've been very clear about where I stand with regard to his comments. And, you know, like I said, we are in conversations right now, and I've been talking with the chief as well. Does that inhibit his presence? Does that inhibit the restructuring that you see is needed? Lieutenant Kroll has not been helpful in any way, shape, or form to uh, generating uh, uh, accountability uh, and measures of reform that we've been trying to see through. And, and I want to be very clear that for generations now, through many different administrations, you've had progressive, forward-thinking mayors and chiefs that have been committed to seeing change. And if we're going to ignore the elephant in the room, we're going to continue to not see the progress that is necessary to be made. And what I'm talking about very clearly, that inhibition to progress, that elephant in the room, it is the police union, it's the collective bargaining agreement, it is the mandatory arbitration provisions that are going through state law. So when we look at reform, we need to be identifying the necessary buckets that need to be changed. Some of it is city policy that in some instances can be done unilaterally. Some instances that unilateral nature is obstructed by the police union contract itself and the negotiations that we go through on a regular basis. Uh, some of that is the arbitration and the laws that have been set up through the state level that prevent us from seeing full accountability. Let me talk, when I say culture shift, let me talk about what I mean. Culture shift, to a certain extent, is about people. People build culture. The way you shift the culture is you get the right people into the jobs that have that mentality of compassion and care and respect for the dignity of every single human being, and you're able to get the individuals, the officers, out that do not have that mentality. And there have been more than a few instances in recent and past years where chiefs and mayors alike have tried to discipline and or terminate, uh, and the discipline or termination works its way through the system and at some point hits a, a, a roadblock. In some cases, that's the arbitration at the very end, where I think somewhere around 45% of the cases that have gone through have been reverted, uh, and the officer is then restored to the department. Um, 
In other cases, there have been other road blockages. Uh, but it is those rock road blockages that we need to address now. And I think the, uh, the, the hope that I have is that we now have the necessary momentum and urgency to act. You know, there's a lot of people that are impatient, and I think that impatience is a necessary tool in ultimately getting the reform, the full restructuring needed. I don't think that I've been the first mayor uh, to talk about these road blockages, and I'm sure I won't be the last. Um, the fact that we now have this urgency around the situation, the fact that we now have this anger and frustration does give us, uh, if we're able to harness it, the ability to push forward and, and hopefully get some of these things done. Let me be clear. It needs to happen. This really can't be optional. Well, you know, Chief Arredondo interviews every single new cadet that comes in. And the reason for literally taking weeks and I think like a month and a half uh, to interview every single new cadet is he wants to be sure they are of the right mindset, the right mentality, and are serving the 440-some-odd thousand residents that we have in our city with compassion and care. That's the purpose. And... You know, if we're going to see that full culture shift, yes, there does need to be changes. And as I said, people build a culture. Uh, and Arredondo is not just laying the seeds, but as you saw today, he's also taking the necessary quick action to make sure that we're seizing this moment. Uh, so as the, I believe the chief mentioned during his press conference, which is what I think you're referencing, the need to have an outside entity, and including lawyers, uh, that are able to come in, review the existing contract, not just make amendments to, not just cut around the edges, but find ways to, yes, shift how that contract itself functions. And if there are road blockages that are extra contractual, like, for instance, state law, we can also examine those principles as well. And so this outside review, I think, is going to be very helpful in finding where the problem areas are and the areas that perhaps can be shifted up. And have you chosen people to do that outside review? And if not, what will the criteria be? Um, I know that we're in, in the process of working with both the chief as well as our partners at the, the Minneapolis Foundation and others to, to figure out who the specific individuals are. Um, we can get you the criteria. Sure. Uh, you know, I, I think the chief could probably answer some of these questions better than I, but I'll at least take a crack at it. It's not as if we don't have the data. We do. Uh, but it's located in several different places, in some instances on a piecemeal basis. Uh, and what you have is officers that have, in some instances, reported to different supervisors at different times. And so while one supervisor may have a deep understanding as to the upsides and downsides of this particular officer as to the problems that they've experienced, that information doesn't necessarily transition by nature. And so what the Joyce Foundation and this EIS service, this early intervention system, allows us to do is to see that information on a real time and be able, hopefully, to predict future patterns. The University of Chicago has done quite a bit of research around determining officer misconduct and what leads to that ultimate action of severe misconduct. And if we're able to, to, to pry that out at an earlier time frame, it helps a whole lot.
All right, so we've just been listening to the mayor of uh, Minneapolis, uh, Jacob Frey, um, express his support for the police chief, who we had heard from just a little bit earlier. Um, so just to remind everyone, city council um, has really voted in Minneapolis to abolish the police force. The police chief uh, held a press conference today outlining some of the changes that he wants to make within the department and sort of said, you know, this debate about abolishing the police force, that will rage on. When I see some policies or some concrete plan in place, that's one thing, but I am the chief of the police force now, and I want to make some corrections. Um, you know, interesting little side note about the current uh, police chief of Minneapolis is he actually sued the police department for discrimination. So you have a police chief who is particularly sensitive to the issues and the need for reform. Um, the other thing that you heard from the mayor is his displeasure with Bob Kroll, who is the police union representative, who he described as, you know, not being helpful in this discussion that they're having about how to reform, what to do, should they abolish um, the police department in uh, Minneapolis. Before that, we were listening to um, a, um, uh, a congressional hearing on the Democrats' plan to reform police um, across the country. So I want to bring in Molly Hooper now um, to kind of talk us through what we had heard earlier today at the House uh, Justice Committee, uh, um, Judicial Committee, rather. Um, there were there was a long list of speakers there, Molly. Um, you know, a whole range, including George Floyd's own brother, who really just put his brother to rest and you know it hasn't even it hasn't been 24 hours and he is testifying in front of lawmakers Right. And actually, some of those lawmakers who were up on the dais, like Karen Bass, actually attended those services last night um, in, in Houston and essentially came up here to do this hearing. And really what they're doing is they're discussing the, the, this bill that the Democrats put forward earlier this week, the Justice and Policing Act of 2020, um, which includes a lot of different provisions that would um, essentially create a more structured and uniform, uh, you know, uh, an effort to to sort of limit how police can react to certain crimes being committed and calls getting. Um, they also have something in there called a national, it's a national database to track police misconduct. Because as we heard from some of the witnesses, one of the problems with, I believe it was um, Chief Acevedo from, from Houston, one of the problems is when a you know, so to speak, bad cop is fired from one police department, then that individual goes to another police precinct and, and, and a different jurisdiction and gets a job there. And there's not really a way to, to track that and police people who've been involved with misconduct. So this bill that the Democrats, primarily Democrats, put forward earlier this week contains a lot of policing reform measures that would not necessarily defund police departments, but would make create more incentives to for communities to invest more money in programs like those cops programs the community orienting policing uh, and and bolster programs in various communities that are underserved so that there are more rehabilitation um, there are more rehabilitation services and whatnot and so it would limit the need for police to actually come in and and you know fight crime limit the crime in those areas and again, as you said, Emory, there were a long list of witnesses that appeared mm -hmm. before the committee. And after this lunch break, they will come back to take questions from the members who are most, many of them, in that auditorium today. Um, yeah, it should be really, really interesting. And just, so let's like sort of see how this, this Q and A is going to go. Because typically um, at these hearings, um, you can almost sort of predict the line of questioning from the Democrats and from the Republicans. But in this case, you know, we have Republicans in the Senate that are working on their own police reform bill. As I understand it, there's an awful lot of overlap. And clearly there is bipartisan energy uh, behind getting this right um, na on a national level. Um, so. What do we expect to hear from the Republicans who will be questioning some of these witnesses? Well, I think what you're going to hear from Republicans um, is something that we heard from Jim Jordan, who is currently the ranking member of the Judiciary Committee, is that what happened was terrible. It was criminal. People need to be brought to justice. But 
defunding the police is not the answer. You know, in fact, this is not the time to defund. Now is the time almost maybe to, to increase spending in some areas for police departments so that they can bolster programs like the community orienting police services, which essentially um, are small units among the police departments, small units that go out and get to know people that they're 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 keeping safe, and their sole purpose is to walk the streets and walk the beats and get to know people, um, so that they can develop more trust with the individuals and the communities that they are are trying to protect and serve. That includes um, getting to know the community leaders, going to high schools, and meeting individuals who haven't necessarily had a very good experience with the police department, um, and sort of eliminating those those barriers that those walls that are put up when police departments really value those statistics of how many arrests did we make today or how many arrests did we make this month and to bolster those programs that tend to be cut when police departments lose funding and um, Daryl Scott one of the witnesses who was called by the Republicans who was also involved with the the presidential Trump, president Trump's campaign um, he mentioned how when I believe it was the city of Cleveland when they cut their police department uh, several years ago how the crime rate has spiked and that's impacting all communities. Um, and so mm -hmm. I think that Republicans will probably take that line of questioning. Um, and Democrats, I don't know if we're going to hear Democrats defending this idea of, of defunding the police. But again, mm -hmm. spending those resources in areas to to essentially eliminate crime in, in some of those more crime-ridden areas. Um, so quickly, you um, brought up at least uh, one per one of the witnesses brought forward by the Republicans. I, I, I'm curious: is do you think that this uh, committee hearing is going to see, um, come across as, for lack of a better word, fair? Are there enough <laughs> voices on both sides? Well, I got to tell you, Anne Marie, I'm looking at this witness list right here, and there's a lot of witnesses on on all sides. And I think what's unique in this situation is that. You know, all sides agree that what happened in Minneapolis to to Floyd to George Floyd, that was atrocious. It was criminal, and people need to be brought to justice. Um, but I think what you're going to hear Republicans focus on is that the the acts of violence against the police officers who have been um, who have been, you know, at these protests has also been been not been problematic as well. And those individuals should hmm. be brought to justice. And so, so there isn't really a disagreement in terms of the fact that there are racial disparities and walls need to be brought down. It's just a matter of how do you do that um, today? And both sides want to make changes. So again, as you, as you mentioned earlier, Senate Republicans have been working on a path forward because really, when it comes to the legislation that makes it to the president's desk, all roads go through the Senate Republicans um, because they do have the majority mm -hmm. in the Senate. And there is an impetus, there is momentum on that side of the aisle to, to make changes. And, and perhaps they aren't necessarily as, as, um, as uh, numerous or as, as, as um, I would say, maybe uh, severe as, say, maybe the Democrats would like to make. But um, when it comes to issues like creating a national database for police misconduct, that's a big deal because, again, going to that point from Art um, from Chief Acevedo, uh, these so-called gypsy gypsy cops who mm -hmm. get fired for misconduct in one precinct and go to another state or or locality to get a job as a cop, that can't be tracked. And so you hire a bad apple, and and so the, a way to nationalize that information would be important. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, Molly Hooper, always great talking to you. Uh, the question. hearing resumes, I think, in about 20 minutes or so. And as Molly pointed out, that's, that's when the Q&A is going to start. Um, thanks a lot, Molly. Thank you. And for now, we're going to take a quick break. You're streaming CBSN, CBS News, always on. In 60 years, we went from about 100,000 factory workers to probably about 7,000. Off in the distance, you can see some factories that are still humming, but most of them are just kind of abandoned. 
The restaurant industry right now is one of the largest and fastest growing industries in America. And yet it continues to be the absolute lowest paying employer in the United States. Barely anybody's making enough to live. You're donating plasma to get by. Uh -huh. It's literally a slave wage. I don't remember growing up like this. My mom didn't have to go to food banks. It's pretty sad. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Oh, boom. And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da, 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 da. and truly original That's reporting. Great. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. How do we put this in perspective about how worried we should be? We're going to share the newest numbers and critical information on the outbreak. Vladimir Dutier is tracking the plight of the restaurant business. Vlad? You've been talking to doctors. What are they saying to you about their experiences? new questions being raised about policing in the U.S. Are police different in the U.S. than they are in other countries? And this conversation is coming up in particular as police uh, responsibilities um, and powers are expanding globally because of this pandemic that we've been uh, dealing with. So I want to bring in Ryan Heath. He's a senior editor for Politico. He wrote an article entitled, Are U.S. Cops Different? And it looks at policing compared to policing in, in other countries. Ryan, great article. Um, the statistics are jarring. You might not think that policing is very different there here, but then when you look at the statistics, when we talk about police involved uh, shootings and killings, it's you, you have to admit that this is a very alarming topic. So I want to ask you, what did you find in your reporting? Well, what we found is that uh, American police are much more heavily armed than most other police forces around the world. And so are the populations they police. And that is a big factor in this huge number of police killings. But it doesn't mean America is alone in having a problem. So even though uh, Americans die in violent confrontations with the police on the street or in their cars in much greater numbers, it does happen in custody situations, for example, in the jail or the, or the prison in other countries, including Australia. Uh, one of the other things that we found is that American police are really not trained in de-escalation tactics, and training hasn't changed a lot over the past 25 years compared to other countries. So you have this situation where the police are very heavily armed, and they go to these weapons much more readily than police in other countries. I mean, Ryan, all you've got to do is look at the reference point that you use in your article, right, uh, and, and through your research and through your reporting. American police killed 1,042 people last year, and in the UK, police killings, only three. So, I mean, it's clear that there is a difference between what police in the United States uh, do and have done versus in other countries, even though other countries are faced with the same crimes, people commit the same crimes here in the US as they commit in the UK or in France. Uh, and, and having lived in a bunch of different countries, including in the UK, including continental Europe and Asia, I can tell you that there are huge differences in policing um, versus the way that it's done here in the United States. Um, and so the question, I guess, becomes, you know, I've often heard from police officials, especially here in New York City, that they go to other countries and they teach other police forces, international police forces, how to police. Um, but it's clear that perhaps those other countries don't want that kind of training. Uh, yes. So, for example, uh, in the U.S., there's not the same consistent uh, social safety net that does exist in some other countries. So you often find the police are left dealing with issues like homelessness, for example. So you don't have experts dealing with problems that require experts. You have the police uh, sometimes stretched out very thin. 
Uh, so interestingly, around this question of should the police be defunded, it's not that law enforcement uh, is uh, particularly well funded in the US. Uh, it's sometimes, in fact, that they're expected to do too much and that they don't necessarily do any of it well. And that sometimes uh, the levels of government that are closest to the people uh, are the ones where all of the law enforcement funding is concentrated. So you have a situation where the layer of government that's supposed to be closest to you is delivering services uh, and protection in a very unequal way. And that feeds the sense of injustice and that uh, police are not trusted uh, to serve the communities that they exist to protect. So in your article, you talk about training and the need for training. Um, there's also this issue about guns and how police are armed here. And in fact, in some uh, countries, police aren't armed at all or they're not armed widespread. Every officer doesn't have a gun. Is that, that's got to be a factor. Absolutely. So look at something like the UK. It's had a domestic terrorism problem. Uh, when you look at the situation in Northern Ireland, when you look at the terror attacks that have occurred in London uh, and in Manchester in recent years, but only around 2% of the police officers there are armed. Even in Ireland, it's only around a quarter of the police officers that are armed, even though they've had these very specific direct problems. Uh, you have other countries like New Zealand, where the Prime Minister of New Zealand, Jacinda Ardern, her father is a retired senior police officer. And she came out this week and said she remains totally opposed to the police um, becoming armed, that that's not a solution to the problem. And they, too, have a very large uh, community of colour there, the native uh, uh, Maori community. It's around about the same size as the African-American community in the US. And New Zealand has managed to survive without this extra arming. The difference, of course, is that in these countries, you don't have a situation where there's one gun per person, which is essentially the average uh, when you look at the US situation. So cops here do have uh, they don't necessarily have the right to be fearful of an individual, but it is much more likely that they'll be conf 